the mother of all talk shows is back. Unleashed, unabridged, uncensored, and unbelievable. Only on Sputnik Radio. Listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Welcome to the fastest growing show in the world, the mother of all talk shows, the Open University of the Airwaves, the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees and where you are positively encouraged to speak back to the teacher. It's a world that seems to be spinning out of control as China builds a 1,000 bed hospital in five days and locks down hundreds of millions of people to try to check the spread of the deadly coronavirus. And as rockets land again on the US Embassy in Baghdad, we'll be reviewing the Middle East from the Lebanon through Syria, Iraq and all the way to Iran. We'll be reviewing events in Washington and in Iowa, where in the first case, Donald Trump is on trial for his political life and in the latter case, Iowa, as we approach the first test of the Democratic Party's election process, Bernie Sanders has established a significant lead. We'll be talking about the Labour leadership, Donkey Darby. We'll be talking about many, many things. So fasten your seatbelts. This is a radio show with pictures, Motes TV. It's going to be the mother of all talk shows. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. This is Radio Sputnik. This is London, but broadcasting to you, of course, all over the world. Thanks to the wonders of the internet, uncontained, uncontrollable, ultimately. Please note, we are on SputnikNews.com. We are on FM in the Washington, D.C. area of the United States of America. 105.5 are the magic numbers there. We're on AM across America from coast to coast. But this is a radio show with pictures, and many, maybe most of you, are watching this on screen now. If you're watching on Facebook, Please share, 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 because I predict this will be another one million viewer audience this evening. Plus, of course, the listeners that can't be counted, but are just as significant to us. You can find it on my own Facebook, George Galloway Official, Blue Tick. You can find it on my YouTube, George Galloway Official. You can find it on my Twitter account. A remarkable number of people are now following us on Twitter. Not just the well over a third of a million following me, but now following the new uh, uh, Moats account, which is called Moats TV. So no longer GG Moats, it's Moats TV. Go to it now and follow it, please. And uh, of course, you can watch on RT's own portals. Uh, the RT UK News, the RT.com, and many others. There are plenty of ways to tune in, and more and more of you are doing so, despite the fact, or maybe because of the fact, that the world does indeed seem to be spinning out of control, an apocalypse looming in the near distance. Let's start in China where well, their new year, Kung He Fa Choi, has begun. The year of the rat and the year of the coronavirus. The Chinese response to this epidemic has been stupendous and could not have been done 
by any other country or system in the world. That's where I stand. I can do no other. So help me, God. Amen. I say it because of this. Who else could build a 1,000-bed hospital in five days? In Britain, we're still talking about the building of HS2, supposed to cost 30 billion, now costing 100 billion, and no longer going north of Birmingham. 100 billion to shave 12 minutes off the trip from London to Birmingham. And it's already years, years behind schedule. The Chinese have done this, and they have locked down hundreds of millions of their own people to try and check the spread of this deadly virus. Q accusations that China is behaving in an authoritarian way. If they had done nothing, of course, if they had treated it like a normal country, they would have been accused of willful irresponsibility in allowing a deadly virus which may kill millions of people to spread around the world. But the sheer scale of China is also demonstrated in this story. Most people watching and listening had never heard of the city of Wuhan, which has 11 million people living in it. And those people spread out across the world as students on business and as tourists. And that's why cases are now popping up all over the world. China's strong central state, its planned economy, makes it the best country in the world to handle this virus. Ask yourself this, could the British Health Service possibly stand up to an event of this magnitude? I think you already know the answer to that. You certainly know it in America because you don't have a health service, although you might come November because Bernie Sanders has just moved into a decisive lead for the Iowa caucuses, the first test of the Democratic Party's process of picking an opponent of Donald Trump. He's promising to introduce a health service. And that's just one of the reasons why I'm praying that he is victorious in Iowa and beyond. We'll be talking to the incomparable Chris Hedges about Bernie Sanders' campaign, but also about the trial now underway in Washington, D.C., of President Donald J. Trump, now fighting for his political life. I thought it was a foregone conclusion that he would survive that Senate trial. He certainly hasn't. He's been going completely berserk on Twitter. More tweets, more berserk tweets, more bonkers tweets, more raving insanity from a president of the United States than anyone in the wildest fiction could ever have imagined possible. Speaking of fiction and speaking of the coronavirus, I'm now tuned in to a wonderful universal TV series called Condor. I'm only on episode three, uh, but the issue uh, that arises from that film is the spread of deliberately engineered diseases into the civilian population. Imagine how topical that is. If you haven't caught up with it yet, I strongly advise you to do so. We'll be talking also about the labor leadership stakes, which are still traveling at a snail's pace, or maybe a donkey walking along Blackpool Beach. But the contest has heated up to some extent with the abandoning ship by Jess Phillips. As uh, someone involved with a rival political party, I was kind of hoping Labour would pick her because that would, en would deliberately uh, engineer the exodus of thousands, maybe tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of Labour Party members. That's not to be. But the contest uh, between Keir Starmer and Rebecca Long Bailey is definitely sharpening. And the contest for Labour's deputy leadership is equally sharp. We'll be talking to, again, the incomparable Chris Williamson, former Labour Member of Parliament for Derby North, witch-hunted, expelled grotesquely, unfairly from the Labour Party about that and about his plans for the future. He's founded a new a political 
grassroots movement, not a party, but a grassroots movement. I'll be asking him all about that. We'll be talking uh, to Patrick Henningsen about the state of play in Belmarsh Jail, where a group of convicts, yes, convicts, finally persuaded the Belmarsh prison authorities to treat the world's greatest publisher, the world's greatest whistleblower, the world's finest journalist, Julian Assange, as a human being. Imagine, not the judges, not British public... ...military confinement of... ...a case. That's where, you'll recall, Syria was falsely accused of landing chemical weapons on the population of Douma in Syria, which provoked, and was intended to provoke, a blizzard of cruise missiles raining down on Syria. It took us to the brink of World War III, that one did, except it was all a hoax. And the British expert at the OPCW has blown the whistle and said that the chemical shell uh, which was found at the scene of the crime in Douma had neither been dropped from the air nor fired as a projectile, but had been deliberately laid down there and allowed to seep out. It is an extraordinary story, not least because nobody knows about it, because a complete blackout in the British media about a British chemical weapons expert, a member of the OPCW a team of specialists has blown the whistle on what is a war crime. It is a war crime to fake a chemical weapons attack as a provocation to set the world on fire. No wonder, if you think about it, they're keeping it quiet. No wonder they're keeping it quiet about what's happening in France, where for 63 weeks the yellow vests have battled the French police and now joined by millions of French workers in a general strike. And we cannot get one moment of the footage on British television, except on RT UK. I don't know what it's like in the United States, but I'm willing to bet there's no footage of what's happening in France every single day, every single weekend. It's a blackout. It's a deliberate blackout. And when you think about it, you can understand it. But it certainly kills the idea for any fools out there that still believed it, that in any way the so-called mainstream media is in any sense, a proper media is in any sense free, is in any sense beholden to the public it pretends to serve. It's a conspiracy against the people. It's a conspiracy on behalf of those who rule us. And of course, even the internet is under pressure. Following the extraordinary success of my clips from last week, when I spoke about the madness of Scottish separatism, I have been subjected to a blizzard. I mean, a blizzard like I never saw in Scotland when I lived there most of my life. A blizzard of foul abuse and threats and cursing and swearing and bad words from people who are forever telling me how irrelevant and unimportant I am. I'm so irrelevant and unimportant, they're all watching and listening to this show right now and getting ready to write about it. Let me tell you, and I mean this most sincerely, folks. You've picked the wrong man to try and intimidate. You cannot silence nor intimidate me. And the more you try, not only will you strengthen my resolve to fight you, you will expose yourselves to the public in Scotland and beyond for the wickedness of your project and the wickedness of your conduct. Ditto uh, the issue uh, of Israel-Palestine. Israel-Palestine has been an issue for me from 1975, when I was 21 years old. I'm not going to shut up about it. You cannot stop me from talking about it. Neither can you intimidate me into taking a different position. 
the last word on my lips, if I can so engineer it, will be Palestine. I will stand up for the Palestinian people until God no longer gives me the breath to do so, and after me, my sons and my daughters, another one of whom, by the way, will be along in a minute. Yes, I'm having my sixth child, or rather, my good wife Gayatri is having it for me. Uh, but uh, I accept your congratulations. But I make the point, only this, that you will not stop me, even if you kill me. Even if you kill me, you will not stop me. Because if you kill me, my words will take wings and will fly farther and higher and reach more and more people. So stop it. The little boy, Kais, who was fished out of the water, was it a well? Was it a reservoir? Was it a flood? Was it a cistern? Who knows? All of these have been mentioned in the reportage. Was he pushed? Did he jump? Was he beaten? Was he kidnapped? And told it's a blood libel to say that the Israeli settlers, illegal, armed thugs, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, might have kidnapped and murdered this boy. Well, how can it be a blood libel? If they killed this little boy, they did not do so because they were Jews. They did not do so even because they were Israelis. They did so because they're settlers. They're European settlers who have seized by force and occupy somebody else's land seeking to drive them away. That's what settlers do when I denounce white Settler apartheid in South Africa. It wasn't a blood libel against Dutch people, a blood libel against British people. It was, a, it was an accusation, a denunciation of apartheid, of the inadmissibility of seizing other people's territory by force and expelling them and oppressing them and killing them. Israeli settlers have killed, have thrown on fires, have put on the grill Palestinian child after child after child. Why is it so difficult for you to believe the initial reports that little Kais was kidnapped, beaten, and thrown into the water where the next day he was fished out, dead from exposure, and cold, still dressed in the coat his mother had sent him out in the day before at 4 p.m. to buy some pita bread from the store. Why would it be in any way a surprise if Israeli settlers, armed illegal Israeli settlers, had murdered him when they had murdered so many children before? In fact, together with the state of Israel itself, Israel has killed thousands of Palestinian children in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, in Lebanon. Thousands of them. So for those of you who say that this is somehow an attack on Jewish people, I say that script is wearing very thin. Just this week, we commemorate it. Uh, the liberation of the death camp at Auschwitz. A liberation, moreover, carried out by the Soviet Red Army. If the Soviet Red Army had not torn the guts from Hitler's war machine, as Winston Churchill put it, there would have been no Jew left alive in Europe and quite possibly the world. No communist, no Roma, no disabled person, no homosexual person, no person who stood up to fascism would still be alive and I'd be speaking to you and very differently indeed in German. All hail the memory of the Red Army that liberated Auschwitz. Never again the Holocaust with a capital H which killed two out of every three Jews 
in Europe. 40% of them Soviet Jews. It's funny that never gets mentioned. 40% of the Jews that were massacred were from the Soviet Union. Never again a Holocaust. Never again a Holocaust with a capital H. Never again a Holocaust with a lowercase h. It's the duty of every right-thinking person to speak out against oppression, to tremble with indignation against oppression anywhere, everywhere. This is the mother of all talk shows. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video and I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Only on Sputnik Radio. Now, to call Chris Hedges a writer, an author, an activist is like saying Ronaldo is a footballer. Chris Hedges is the best. He's the best writer. He's the best talker. He's the best preacher. He's the best analyst. He's the best broadcaster in the United States of America. And how lucky are we that he joins us now. Chris Hedges, welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Thank you, George. Chris, let's start with Donald Trump. I had thought uh, that this was a foregone conclusion in the Senate, uh, that it was a piece of political theater and not even a very good one, uh, based on the flimsiest of pretexts. But judging by Donald Trump going into overdrive on Twitter, he seems to be a bit worried about it. What do you think is going to happen? Well, in the final outcome, I think, is uh, without doubt going to be his acquittal by the Senate. Um, yeah, he is, of course, quite disturbed by it, uh, but I don't think it poses a political threat. You think the Democrats will have prospered uh, as a result of prosecuting it? I saw a poll today saying 50% uh, of people wanted the Senate to find him guilty and expel him from office, 44% against. It's a very high risk political strategy that, isn't it? Given the 44 percent have all got guns? Yeah. Well, I mean, the country has remained uh, divided over this issue, uh, and those polls have not varied very much through the whole process. Uh, and I think that's because the Democratic Party has uh, charged Trump with constitutional violations uh, that he ind indeed committed, but uh, ones that are trivial compared to the ones that have been normalized by both the Democratic and Republican administrations, beginning with George W. Bush through Obama. What are they? Uh, those would be uh, the uh, prosecution of uh, illegal wars, uh, 11 of them if we count Yemen without congressional approval. That would be the programs of extraordinary rendition, the kidnapping, torture, 
seizure of citizens. They're trying to do that right now to Julian Assange. He's not an American citizen. WikiLeaks is not a U.S. publication. Uh, the wholesale surveillance exposed by Edward Snowden in violation of the Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy, uh, the uh, misinterpretation, gross legal misinterpretation of the 2002 Authorization to Use Military Force Act by the Obama administration to revoke due process and carry out the assassination of a U.S. citizen, Anwar Awlaki, two weeks later, his 16-year-old son, in essence, giving the executive branch the role of judge, jury, and executioner. And then you have uh, uh, treaty violations that are supposed to be ratified by uh, the Senate, uh, making appointments without Senate approval, uh, executive orders that override led. All of these uh, constitutional violations uh, are used by both parties. And I think, in fact, what they've done is pick the most trivial violations uh, to tag Trump. And that selective enforcement uh, I think uh, erodes much of the credibility of the Democratic Party. They're not attempting to restore the rule of law. Uh, they're attempting to get rid of Trump. Let's uh, segue uh, into the Julian Assange case for a moment. Your friend, my friend. Uh, the good news is he's out of solitary confinement, not thanks to the tender mercies of the British judiciary or even British public opinion, but the convicts in the jail uh, have uh, prevailed in forcing the authorities to release him from solitary confinement, which was cruel and unusual treatment indeed. The United States said this week uh, that uh, uh, the protection that is enjoyed, if that's the word, by you and others in the United States to freedom of speech, freedom to publish, uh, the uh, First Amendment protections do not extend to Julian Assange, a foreign citizen, who never did any of the things he's accused of in the United States in any case. So First Amendment protection does not apply to Julian Assange, but America's right to punish him for what he publishes does exist. That's a particularly bizarre pantomime horse, that one, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, of course, very dangerous because first it's Julian and then uh, it's the rest of us. Uh, and the kind of silence on the part of the mainstream publications, which, like the New York Times, all published uh, the information that was provided by WikiLeaks, uh, is, uh, I think, very uh, self-defeating. Uh, you're watching now with Glenn in, in Brazil, Bolsonaro go after Glenn Greenwald. Now, he's going after Greenwald the same way the United States goes after Assange. Uh, they know that legally uh, there's not a lot of uh, ground to stand on for publishing classified material. I indeed published classified material on the front page of the New York Times when I worked there. And so uh, you try and uh, uh, tar them or, or uh, attack them for uh, pilfering or stealing that material, although, of course, Julian did not, in the same way that uh, Glenn did not uh, take the material about corruption in Brazil, but published it. Uh, and so you're watching these same avenues of assault. Uh, and that's why they seized Chelsea Manning, held her again in solitary confinement, uh, uh, because she wouldn't testify in a grand jury testimony without a lawyer, without legal representation, to essentially uh, provide uh, evidence against Julian that he had pressured her to release the information when he had not. And didn't even let her out to attend her late mother's funeral this week. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is uh, a kind of uh, common denominator among these authoritarian uh, regimes. The United States uh, is certainly pretty close to being defined as one. Uh, and it is the mechanism by which they criminalize journalism, but more importantly, criminalize those who shine an inner light on the, the workings or, or criminal behavior of power. And what would stop, what would there be to stop uh, 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 Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, seeking the extradition of a British journalist uh, exposing the crime of sawing up the Washington Post uh, columnist Jamal Khashoggi? Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's right. It does set a kind of a global precedent or or gives a kind of green light to authoritarian regimes around the world to essentially seize journalists who are not even 
nationals of that country. Uh, and of course, this is exactly what the United States is doing uh, a, a, with, with Julian uh, and prosecute them uh, for, for publishing information that uh, they deem harmful to their grip on power. Let's turn to happier news. Bernie Sanders, Iowa, is he going to do it? I think, uh, I mean, I, I remain convinced that the donor class that controls the Democratic Party, as they did in 2006, will uh, stop at nothing uh, to make sure that Bernie Sanders is not the nominee uh, or Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren is a much more problematic figure, but they don't like her rhetoric. Um, and we saw a lot of dirty tricks in 2006, uh, the use of the Democratic National Committee as a vehicle to further the Clinton campaign and stymie uh, the Sanders campaign, the, the outright theft of caucuses like the Nevada caucus, the imposition of rules that independents were not allowed to vote in the primaries. Many of Bernie's young supporters are not registered Democrats, they're independents. Uh, and we have seen several articles in the New York Times, three or four in the last couple of weeks, where they interview anonymous members of the Democratic uh, you know, donor class, these you know, Goldman Sachs types, who are already meeting to make sure that Warren and Sanders is not the nominee and Biden is the nominee, um, which I think we will then see a replay of, of 2016, Biden being a kind of slower version of Hillary Clinton with hair plugs. Um, so uh, I, um, I think given the structure of the Democratic Party, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult for Sanders to get the nomination. The superdelegates are still in place. These are all appointed by the DNC. The DNC itself is dominated solely by superdelegates. Uh, so uh, he's up against a machine that's extremely hostile. Uh, and then we have many oligarchs who uh, have said publicly that if Sanders or Warren uh, ends up with a nomination, uh, they will hold their nose and, and work for Trump. Yeah, I mean, that would be handing the election to Trump if they do, as you suspect they will, uh, because all of the polling shows uh, that Sanders is best placed to beat Trump. Trump was revealed in the week as saying that he would not have won uh, if Bernie had been, for example, Hillary Clinton's vice presidential pick. Uh, because of his appeal to blue-collar workers in the uh, so-called Rust Belt post-industrial industrial America. Uh, this would be handing a second term uh, to Donald Trump, who they've spent four years telling us was alternately unhinged uh, or a Russian agent. Uh, what kind of uh, democratic donor class would that be? Well, the same kind of Blairite, Laborites that sabotage Corbyn's election. Um, you can't underestimate the level of hostility within the Democratic Party, which is also true in the Labor Party, and was unleashed on Corbyn. Uh, and uh, these people, uh, because in the end, it's about class interests. It's about deregulation. It's about trade agreements that uh, impoverish and uh, uh, you know render the American working class chronically underemployed or unemployed. Uh, th that's what the primacy is. Remember that there's no real division on the major issues in terms of trade or imperial war or wholesale surveillance or anything else between the two ruling parties. Uh, and they will come together if they feel that their class interests are threatened. We have in the United States undergone what John Ralston Stahl calls a coup d'etat, corporate coup d'etat in slow motion, uh, and, and they've won. So uh, I certainly, I voted for Sanders in the primary. I will vote for him again. Uh, but I'm, I will be highly surprised if the Democratic Party establishment uh, allows him to get the nomination. Yeah, of course, uh, the people uh, in the caucuses and in the primaries that are coming up are not, uh, you know, automatons. They cannot be controlled by, by this donor class. It looks like uh, that uh, Sanders is ahead in Iowa and that, that Warren uh, is now the pick of the Des Moines Register. The uh, traditional uh, uh, endorsement has gone to her. It's going to be difficult to micro control these contests. Is what you're saying that when it comes to the convention itself, uh, that the, the rigging will take place? Because they can't rig elections 
that involve hundreds of thousands, millions of people, can they? No, but they can create difficulties for Sanders supporters, which is what they did in 2016. New York State alone, uh, or, you know, uh, delegitimizing over 300,000 registered Democrats. Uh, the uh, denial of the ability of independents to vote was quite an effective technique uh, in terms of turning away Sanders supporters. So they won't wait till the convention. As a matter of fact, they aren't waiting until the convention. Uh, the efforts to undermine Sanders and Warren is already in full swing. And if you doubt me, read any profile of Bernie Sanders in the New York Times. Yeah, sure. Um, although in flyover America, the New York Times writ doesn't run uh, no. all that uh, far. <laughs> not, not really. <laughs> That's um, right. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's think ahead then. Let's say Sanders is cheated again. Warren is cheated. Do they just do as they did in 2016, unwisely in my view, uh, accept it and go out campaigning for Joe Biden? Or do they finally launch a serious, heavyweight, third party, left of the Democratic Party campaign for president? No, neither Warren or Sanders will do that. Sanders, although he's registered as an independent, has been a de facto member of the Democratic Party. Uh, he uh, has seniority within the party. Uh, he dutifully served as Schumer's kind of lapdog after the election. He went out and campaigned for Hillary Clinton. Uh, I, I spoke with Sanders about him running as an independent, and his answer to me was that he didn't want to end up like Ralph Nader, uh, i.e. a political pariah. Uh, and, and Sanders is not wrong about that. The Democratic Party would use every mechanism at their disposal to destroy him uh, should he attempt to uh, do what he should have done, which is walk out of the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia uh, and run as an independent. I was actually there with my friend Cornell West. We led a or led, we'd been part of a march of homeless uh, on the uh, Democratic Convention, the appropriately named Wells Fargo Center. And so Cornell and I were listening to uh, Bernie's uh, in endorsement of Clinton uh, as he spoke at the convention. And Cornell said quite pressingly, he missed his historical moment. Uh, but I think given uh, the uh, kind of political history of both Warren and and Sanders neither has the political courage to step back and take on the Democratic Party establishment. I must say, I think that Ralph Nader's name in history will shine rather more brightly than Hillary Clinton's, don't you? Of course. I think Ralph is, uh, who's a good friend, and I was Ralph's speechwriter when he was running for president, uh, has fought uh, corporate uh, uh, power uh, longer and, and with more integrity and often more successfully than any other American. I told you he was good, didn't I? Chris Hedges, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Thanks, George. Now there's a poll. Uh, will, with the spread of coronavirus, should we A, freeze air links with China, B, write a will, C, keep calm and carry on? I'm keep, keeping calm and carrying on. Uh, I've already written a will, at least I hope I have. Uh, and I'm totally against freezing air links with China, but people have to be checked at both ends uh, that are coming from China. And I understand that that is coming. There's cases uh, or people from Wuhan who've proved negative uh, when tested in, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, but in places like Singapore, in Hong Kong, and uh, the new year was cancelled in Hong Kong. It was cancelled in Beijing. Now, when you know how important uh, the new year is, to Chinese people, uh, you see the scale of the shift, the changes that the Chinese state is making in people's behavior for fear of this virus uh, spreading. I have no idea uh, how this virus came to be, uh, but I'm always suspicious. Maybe I watch too much Netflix, uh, too much uh, Universal TV. Uh, now, uh, we will have the following in the rest of the show. Dr. Jamal Wakim, author and Lebanese academic on the protests in Lebanon, the situation in Syria, the protests in Iraq, and how it all impacts. Now, as I said at the beginning, five rockets have just landed on the US embassy in Baghdad. So we may be back to a very dangerous situation there indeed. Then uh, later in the next hour, we'll be talking to Patrick Henningsen, global affairs analyst, journalist, TV 
and radio broadcaster about the OPCW, uh, Duma leaks, and also about his friend, my friend, Julian Assange. And in the final hour, we meet the incomparable Chris Williamson, former MP, martyr, martyr to the Labour Party's insane capitulation to the supporters of Israel. It's uh, all coming up. Now, let me uh, take you back to my short. I do these every week for RT. Uh, this one's particularly short, short. Take a look at it. I love the smell of diplomacy in the morning. I love that the G20 are all there and that they're all committed to speaking to each other. Last time, Donald Trump, in a state of terror at the Mueller investigation, didn't even meet with President Putin, despite the pressing and urgent matters that exist between them. Now we have a chance, Trump and Putin, discussing nuclear weapons, the INF Treaty, the issue of short and medium range nuclear missiles in Europe, especially important as the summit is taking place in Osaka. Where is Osaka? It's in Japan, which was twice eviscerated by the world's only use of nuclear weapons. They need to be discussing Iran and the danger of World War III breaking out there. Trump needs to be discussing this insane trade war with China. They all need to be discussing the need to stop trying to regime change in Venezuela. They need to be talking about Nord Stream 2, a win-win economic project, which is for the benefit, yes, of Russia, but more importantly, for the people of all of Europe who want good quality and good priced gas as we approach winter time. We need to stop political interference on trade matters. We need to drop these sanctions which are wrecking relations and economies all over the world. The G20 are there, the big 20. They've got time and space. Let's get them round. One big table, yes, but lots of smaller tables where they can reach common sense conclusions about the world's pressing issues. The great war leader, Winston Churchill, said, war, war is a much more dangerous way than Joe, Joe of resolving the world's problems. And he was right about that. These lesser war leaders need less war, war, more Joe, Joe. Glory to the G20. I never thought I'd hear myself saying that. Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. That was actually the wrong shot, but it was good to see again the younger me. I've no idea when I made that, and the first few bars of it I didn't even recognize. It should have been the Devils of Davos. We'll see if we can dig that out for you later. A big thanks to all who came to East Kilbride, an absolutely packed house, uh, standing room only at the Village Theatre in East Kilbride uh, last Saturday night. Seems like a long time ago now. It was uh, a rip-roaring uh, audience. I'm speaking on Saturday at the Cars Lane Church Centre in Cars Lane in Birmingham. I'm seeing twice actually. I'm opening the meeting at 11 a.m. and I'm closing uh, the uh, meeting at 4 p.m. So you get two speeches for the price of one and it's only three pound and that's just to cover the hall. So if you want to uh, go to that, it's available, I think, uh, on Eventbrite, but I'll get you the exact script and details later. So Birmingham, if you're anywhere in the West Midlands or travel distance, you can meet me. You can buy my new novel and get it signed. It's going very well. Queensway being critically acclaimed, uh, as they say. Uh, on Saturday in Birmingham in the Cars Lane Church Centre. Brian Paul says, can you talk about libertarian versus authoritarian socialism, please? Probably not, Brian, it would bore 
everyone. Uh, Zona says, funny how Galloway, who claims he cares about murdered kids, has never discussed the hundreds of thousands of kids mass murdered by the bloodthirsty barbaric savages Assad and Putin. P.S. I'm ready to debate you any time. That Zona who lives in occupied Palestine used to phone up and na 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 on a TV show I used to have. Thanks for watching, Zona. It is a tremendous compliment to me that you just can't stay away from me. And Thomas says, would Bernie Sanders free Julian Assange if he were to become president, George? I certainly hope so, Thomas. Uh, Will in Singapore says, congratulations to Ibu Gayatri and yourself on your impending blessing. May he, she grow to be happy, healthy and strong. Please wish all Chinese viewers a happy new year. Kong Hei Fa Choi, which did you find more amusing during the Trump impeachment trial? The absence of evidence and witnesses presented or the Chief Justice presiding yet powerless to allow evidence or make rulings? The whole thing's a farce to me, Will. Uh, a lot of tweets about the coronavirus. SAFC uh, Living123 says, to combat coronavirus, we should temporarily halt immigration from China till it's over. There ain't no immigration from China. Who in the right mind in China would be immigrating here? China's the most successful country in the whole world, you fool. CC, George, watch World War Z and ask your poll question again. World War Z, I don't know that one, I'll look it up. Swim Anon says, keep calm and carry on. The media sells fear. The regular flu kills thousands of people every year and people don't bat an eye. We will soon forget this outbreak next week when the next phony existential crisis pops up after the impeachment hoax. Well, they didn't look all that phony, the dead people in China, to me. Mark W, quite remarkable the Chinese can build two hospitals in a matter of days to deal with the affected people. It would take us years. And uh, Traloach, Traolach, 35. Am I alone in thinking it might have come from a Frankenstein lab in the USA to destabilize the Chinese state and economy, given an election might be on the horizon in the US and the current leader is in enough trouble as is. Makes you wonder, my friend. Mummy girl, Bev Steen says, personally freezing air links may seem strict and costly, but if it's a safety valve, then apply it. Why not? Grim Sleeper says, halting flights from China is definitely a possibility just until they can contain the virus. And Real Stockton says, with a globalized world, we must practice caution. Screen any way we can in a passive manner. Screen for fever. Better observations at customs intake. Multi-language information on video at border checkpoints, inside airports, and on paper in multi-language form like yesterday. And Faye Hansen says, ignore the whole thing. It's a bunch of hype over next to nothing. There are 10,000 cases of death by flu every year. But for some reason, they want us to go crazy over coronavirus. Why the distraction? What are they up to? And RJ says it re it's really too late to stop air travel. China did it for the world, mostly. And Gita Renick says, I'm ordering a box of medical masks just to me on the safe side. Uh, in, I'm allergic to nicotine and everyone smokes in doorways, streets and outdoor cafe areas. Nicotine is a trigger. Well, I'm flying soon uh, and I'm going to wear a medical mask. Call me Fiat if you like. Uh, Agile Cabbage says, unlike some, I think this is a serious concern. Spanish flu had a mortality rate of 2% and killed 50 million people and a rate of infection of around two. Coronavirus has a mortality rate estimated at 4% and an infection rate of 3.5 to 4.5 million people left Wuhan before the blockade. And Bilzer says, should we leave a bill instead of a will? Quite a good gag. Oh my goodness, here's very, very dramatic breaking news. Kobe Bryant has been killed in a helicopter crash in Calabasas, California. The 41-year-old basketball star's death was confirmed by TMZ. The outlet reported that Bryant was traveling with four other people in his private helicopter when it crashed 
killing everyone on board. The cause of the crash is under investigation. I'm extremely sorry to have to read out uh, that news. And let's go to New York and talk to Chuck on line one. Chuck, welcome. Yes, thank you. And uh, gosh, my feelings go out for Kobe Bryant. Very, very everyone. popular, very popular man. My goodness. Uh, what a oh, loss. That's terrible. Yeah. Um, I was calling, actually. Glad to see you had Chris Hedges on. And He's thanks wonderful. for what you're all yeah. doing. Yeah, thanks. He is. I, w I did Occupy in uh, D.C. with him and uh, Cornell West and and went to uh, Bradley Manning's trial uh, tribunal, military tribunal, years mm, ago. Mm. And uh, I, I was hoping that I could speak to you and Chris, but if you would just respond, Chelsea Manning, uh, is it true? Get $1,000 a day fine right now? Uh, and, uh, it's, it's at least you know, $1,000 yeah, every yeah. day she's fine. So, of course, she's bankrupt. Uh, uh, and her mother, her mother died this week, and even though oh, she's no. an untried prisoner... She's not, she's not been convicted of any crime uh, that yeah. would uh, stop her uh, being allowed to visit her mother's funeral. She was not allowed to do so. It's unbelievable. Talk about cruel and, grand, and inhuman punishment. The grand jury in the U.S. can put you away forever and fine you every day, I guess. So yes, yes. anyway, Without I want to thank tried. you for everything. <laughs> Thanks, thank you Chuck. for everything you're doing. Bye-bye. God bless you. Thank you very much, Chuck, in New York. David is in Scotland. I wonder if he'll be so kind. Go ahead, David. <laughs> Hi, George. How are you? Good to see you as always. Thank you. Uh, George, um, are you, what are you standing or who are you standing for at the Scottish election? I thought that was very interesting news that you were going to stand, George. Well, uh, I, I won't necessarily be standing. In fact, my wife will probably break my legs to stop me uh, doing so. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, uh, our party, the party of which I'm the leader, the Workers' Party of Britain, will definitely be standing uh, in the Scottish Parliament elections because Scottish Labour is dead uh, yes. and is led by people simply incapable of taking the fight to the separatists, to the SNP. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I have the capability of fighting the SNP. I've been doing it all oh, my life. It always, uh, always amuses me, David, when they call me yeah. uh, a traitor. A traitor to No, what? I don't think you're a traitor. I agree I, with the one thing you yeah, say, George. David. Even though I'm a libertarian and you're a socialist, yeah. I, I still agree with a lot of things you say. David, I have opposed Scottish separatism literally all of my life. I have hated mm. the SNP all of my uh, life. It's not as if I was once a supporter of Scottish separatism and have now changed sides. I'm merely uh, doing and saying what I always did and said. So how well, is that me, a traitor? Like, Secondly, well, most me, Scottish people are on my side. We won the yeah, referendum. Well, let, me put, let me put this to you, George. I think, I mean, obviously it was the Labour Party that brought in the Scottish Parliament in the first place, but I definitely think there is a requirement for a greater devolution of powers, not necessarily breaking up uh, the, the United Kingdom. But, but let me ask you about that, Dave. Let me ask you about yeah. that. How well are they doing with the powers they've already got? I would say that was the SNP, though. They're not doing very well, not the fact that they've got the powers. Who's got the powers that the, the, the issue is? I don't think Nicholas Sturgeon's that great, great shakes, to be honest with you, mm. as a First Minister. I agree with that. I don't she, think she's no, I think she's Alex no Salmon was a lot better. I yeah. thought Alex Salmon, was a, Alex Salmon, to me, was like Nigel Farage, was probably two of the best, uh, or the two of the greatest uh, non mainstream political entities who have had well, in my life. Uh, Al Al Alex Salmon was a giant uh, political figure compared yeah. to Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, we better not yeah. say much more about him because uh, he's got a trial uh, uh, coming yeah. up. So, David, to answer your question, uh, I don't know if I'll be standing in the Scottish Parliament elections. If I was, this wouldn't be the place to talk about it. Uh, but yeah. the Workers' Party of Britain definitely will, because we think there's a big gap there amongst working-class yeah, people so, in yeah. Scotland uh, that, uh, that support and embrace Brexit and oppose the breakup of Britain. David, thanks for yeah. your call. I've got to go to Ottawa and talk to Samir. Go ahead, Samir. Hey, good afternoon, George. 
But it's a pleasure calling you here. It's my first time calling in. I just wanted to mention a few things because I listened to, I've been listening to you for years now, and Thank I always you. wanted to call you. Thank you. But, uh, you know, uh, one thing in my heart uh, has been going on for a long time is the Palestinian cause, you know, because Palestinian people, I meet so many of them. Not that I don't meet Jews or Jewish people. I have lots of Jewish friends that I've uh, met over the years, you know. And, and you know, I find some some Jews or Jewish people supporting the uh, the, the, the Zionist or the... Uh, the Israeli establishment and the Palestinians complaining and crying and all kinds of stuff like that uh, over the years. So I just wanted to say, um, why are these people not getting together and uh, uniting as a Palestinian? Uh, you know, the land was called Palestine long before Israel, long before the Arabs came, long before everybody. So they all agreed many years ago before, like I'm talking about, Fifteen uh, a thousand years ago, they all agreed that they're going to call this land Palestine. It's not Arab. It's not Jewish. It's not nobody's land. It's the, the Philistines' land long before these two groups came. And they all agreed. So I'm just wondering why are they fighting now, you know, for the last 70 years or so? Well, uh, you know, I tend not to go back uh, uh, that far. Uh, I tend to go back uh, uh, as far as 1948. Uh, when 800,000 Palestinians were driven from their homes, their villages destroyed and built upon, that 800,000 has now become 11, 12, or 13 million people uh, who are homeless, without status, without papers, as refugees, uh, living lives of uh, unendurable misery in many, many cases, in Lebanon, in Jordan, uh, or as far north as the uh, Yellowknife in the Arctic Circle, where I met the world's northernmost Palestinian refugees. The Palestinians have been scattered to the four winds today, no, today, no, this, I, I, this, I, this day. No. But, but my, point, my point is, I'm in favor of a binational state of Israel-Palestine, where the but population that of already, Israel... George. But how has it happened already? Many years ago, that's when they signed a deal between the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. They all signed a deal together. No. I don't know if you remember the, the Crusades. This Crusades and went had a war, and they, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they won uh, some, they yeah. lost some, and they came. They got together it, and they made. Yeah, I find it unprofitable to debate the Crusades in this context. Uh, I'm saying that now, the presence. No, I'm just giving you an example of the past, George. That's yeah, like I know. How we went I know. This already. Well, I know. But uh, no, there's no takers for waving the flags of the Crusades as a way forward. Here's the way forward. That the Jews, yeah. the Christians, and the Muslims exist in a state called Israel-Palestine as equal citizens under the law. That is right. the best way forward. And that's what I uh, fight for. Uh, Samir, don't be a stranger. Uh, it's good to hear from you in Ottawa. But I need to read some uh, more of the tweets that are coming in in uh, very significant numbers. Nick Bickle says coronavirus was clearly cultured in a West supporting laboratory and released in Wuhan as yet another way of bashing China's economy. By creating such a worldwide scare, Big Pharma is also trying to bully the masses into taking up vaccines to please Bill Gates, WHO and the New World Order. That's how to pack so many conspiracy theories into one single paragraph. Peter from the North says, why freeze the flights? For decades, this country has been actively encouraging all and sundry from all parts of the world with no screening at all. We have people bringing all sorts of viruses here, coming over here, bringing their viruses. Robert says, coronavirus, mother nature, doing a little spring cleaning. That's a trifle Malthusian to me. Robert. And Rai says, I can't recall a single time during my 40 plus years on this planet when 61 million people are under a quarantine order. Seems pretty serious. I get that there is such a thing as fear porn, but not sure it applies here. Quite so, Rai. And Neo Aether says, supposedly Canada, with some sort of connection to the Netherlands or something like that. I didn't look into that much. Connected to the Wuhan lab somehow. I think that might have been another article, or maybe from the previous SARS. There's really just not enough info. Whatevers. Yes. Uh, what?
endeavors. Now, as I said, in the second hour, coming up very shortly, we'll be talking to Dr. Jamal Wakim, a very considerable expert and popular talker on the issues of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. Maybe we'll even reach Iran. It's the mother of all talk shows, and there's two whole hours still to go. Stay tuned. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat for America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fault Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Lee and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. China is warning the ability of the deadly coronavirus to spread is getting stronger as the number of infected globally rises to more than 2,000. The authorities say little is known about the new virus and they're unclear on the risk posed by it mutating. Some 56 people have died from the virus so far. Several Chinese cities are imposing significant travel restrictions as well. Wuhan, the source of the outbreak, is in effective lockdown. China says the incubation period for the coronavirus can range from 1 to 14 days, and it is infectious during this time. In response to the mounting crisis, containment efforts, which to date have included travel restrictions and the cancellation of major events, are to be ramped up in China. The U.S. is also to evacuate its diplomatic staff from the region and has offered a limited number of seats on the flight out of the country to its citizens at greater risk. Britain is also considering pulling out citizens from the affected areas. China's officials have announced that the sale of all wildlife in the country is now banned. The virus is thought to have originated in animals, but no cause has been officially identified. Next footage has emerged of a two-year-old girl being rescued from rubble in Turkey after a 6.8 magnitude earthquake. The toddler, who was covered in dust, was pulled free by a rescue worker. At least 31 people have been killed following the quake in the country's east, and it is feared that more than 20 others are still trapped under debris. Next, in southeast Brazil, at least 30 people have died after two days of heavy rain caused flooding and landslides. 17 people are missing and 2,600 people have been moved to safety from their homes. Images show people, including children, swimming through some of the flooded streets. Well, more rain is expected in Minas Gerais, as well as other parts of Brazil, including Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. 
And the U.S. plane manufacturer Boeing has successfully completed the first flight of the world's largest twin-engine jetliner. It took three attempts to get the plane off of the ground as the first two planned tests were abandoned due to high winds. While the aircraft, which is 77 meters long and can seat more than 400 passengers, took off from a runway just outside of Seattle on the U.S. west coast. Four hours later, it landed at the historic Boeing Field, not far from rows of 737 MAX planes left grounded after two fatal crashes triggered safety concerns. The new Boeing model, which will be officially known as the 777-9, also has folding wingtips that mean it can fit its wings into the same parking bays as other jets. The plane is expected to enter service in 2021. And the outgoing chief of staff of Israel's defense forces, Gadi Eisenkot, has acknowledged for the first time that Israel had provided weaponry to Syrian rebel groups during the country's seven-year civil war. Until today, Israel has officially always said that it had given humanitarian aid to Syrian opposition groups across the border while denying or refusing to comment on reports it had supplied them with arms as well. However, Eisenkot is now admitting Israel had provided light weapons to the rebel groups along the border, saying it was for self-defense. Israel's supply of weapons to these opposition groups had been reported for years, both by the Syrian army and by opposition groups, but it was never confirmed by Israel officials. And finally, the 62nd Annual Grammy Awards will be taking place in Los Angeles tonight. Billed as music's biggest night, the ceremony is more like music's longest day, with festivities kicking off at lunchtime in L.A. and stretching out into the night. Pop star Lizzo leads the nominations with eight in total, including album and song of the year. The forthcoming Bond film singer Billie Eilish and Lil Nas X are close behind with six each. All three represent a new vanguard of pop charismatic and pop conformist with songs that defined the last 12 months. And U.S. rapper YG, who was due to perform at the Grammys, has been released on bail after being arrested for alleged robbery. The performer, whose real name is Keenon Jackson, was let out by police after being held on a $250,000 bail. He's due in court on Tuesday for an arraignment where charges will be formally put to him and he will be asked to enter a plea. Well, that's all for Sputnik News. I'm Emily Horn. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Well, a staggering number of you want to freeze air links with China. 42% of you. Uh, 5% of you think we should write a will in the face of the coronavirus. And a majority, slim majority, though by today's standards, maybe a good majority, agree with me. Keep calm and carry on. You can vote now on my Twitter feed. Now, the situation in the Levant uh, is extremely unstable, topsy-turvy. There are all kind of forces acting on the situation in Lebanon. The situation of Lebanon cannot be separated from the uh, situation in Syria. Indeed, the countries were separated by colonialism and the colonial powers as were, and now again are, are heavily involved in political events in the Lebanon. And the satrapies in the Arabian Gulf, in the Persian Gulf area, are also heavily involved, as indeed is Iran. It's a very, very complicated picture. For those of you who say they support democracy in Lebanon, I just make the point to you that if there was democracy in Lebanon, if the president could be freely elected by popular uh, suffrage, uh, one man, one woman, one vote, then Saeed Hassan Nasrallah would be the president of Lebanon. But Lebanon has a complicated constitution whereby the president must always be a Christian. This based on a census now 70 years old. 
and the Prime Minister must always be a Sunni Muslim and the Speaker of the Parliament must always be a Shia Muslim. There are also Druze uh, and other minorities involved in a very complicated, specifically Lebanese constitution. I didn't draw up, I don't even support it. But those who seek to undermine the new cabinet in Lebanon and who do so in the name of democracy are willfully denying the information I have just given you. Dr. Jamal Wakim is a very popular author and academic. He is a well-known figure across the Arab world and I'm glad he's found the time tonight on the mother of all talk shows to join us. Dr. Jamal, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, good evening, and this is an honor for me to be with you on the show and hope it would be fruitful and helpful. Sharafna, the honor is mine, doctor. Uh, now, the, let's start with Lebanon. Uh, there's a new cabinet. It looked quite modern and quite female to me, but the Western journalists say it's a Hezbollah cabinet. Is that true? Describe for us the new government in Lebanon and its prospects, please. Well, uh, uh, the situation, as you explained in your introduction, it's very complicated in Lebanon. Uh, but uh, I, I'll try to be uh, straight to the point uh, and try to give a background uh, to my uh, uh, answer. Uh, first, I don't believe that it's the government of Hezbollah. Uh, of course, Hezbollah, uh, uh, we need to admit the fact that Hezbollah uh, has uh, acquired a lot of influence in the past uh, two decades due to um, circumstances, that, uh, especially his uh, policies directed uh, towards uh, resisting American influence in the region and at the same time his success in uh, uh, fighting back and uh, defending Lebanon against uh, Israel. So, and Israeli aggressions. Uh, I, um, I'm 47 and I remember all Israeli aggressions since I was a child. I, I re uh, remember very well, for example, the 1982 uh, invasion of Lebanon that uh, led to, to thousands of victims among the Lebanese and Palestinians. So, uh, Hezbollah have been successful. The Americans wanted to uh, isolate Hezbollah and they benefited from many factors in Lebanon. Hezbollah uh, tried to uh, deal uh, 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 with Lebanese politics uh, from a distance. So uh, prior to 2005, Hezbollah never participated in, uh, the, in any government. It was always in the opposition. And at the same time, uh, there were uh, discussions even uh, in, uh, within the party back in 1992 whether it was feasible to run for legislative elections. But after 2005, Hezbollah needed to be part of the government in order to ensure that any government that would be formed would uh, give legitimacy to uh, the resistance, to the Lebanese resistance, especially that the state, the, uh, the, go uh, the government and state in the past four or five decades have failed to defend the Lebanese people against Israeli aggressions. So um, uh, the Americans knew that very well and knew that the whole uh, or uh, the majority of the Lebanese uh, uh, political elite is corrupt, including uh, allies of Hezbollah, uh, but uh, most and foremost, the opponents of Hezbollah, the ones member in the uh, March 14th coalition, who were the allies of the Americans. So uh, at one point, especially after the uh, uh, President Donald Trump uh, took office uh, back in January 2017, after he won the elections, uh, he started to step up his pressures on Lebanon, and at the same time on Iran, led by um, a drive or, uh, or led by the neocons in his administration, represented now by Mike Pompeo. They tried uh, to isolate Hezbollah on the political level. When they failed, they started to exert pressure on the economic, uh, or, uh, or, uh, on the economy of Lebanon. Uh, of course, uh, the economy of Lebanon uh, is... Um, 
uh, or suffers from deep uh, structural problems since 1992, as uh, all productive sectors, industrial and agricultural, were marginalized, were destroyed to the favor of the banking sector, the, uh, uh, which was promoted especially after the war, and uh, to make Lebanon or to render Lebanon uh, a sort of uh, uh, um, like the Canary Islands or uh, any other uh, um, microstate that depends on the banking sector, or to give a safe haven for uh, money to be laundered or Western money to be laundered in Lebanon. So they benefited from this, and this uh, led the economy to crisis, especially after uh, the accumulation of debt uh, of $100 billion, which is twice the GDP of Lebanon, and this led to the crisis. Of course, there were calls for a technocrat or specialist government. However, we know very well that we had uh, in Lebanon um, uh, a sort of experience with technocrats. Fouad Senyura, uh, pr former uh, prime minister and the minister of finance for decades, who was uh, one of the uh, biggest symbols of corruption in Lebanon, was a technocrat or was presented as a technocrat back in 1992. Same with Hariri, Rafi Hariri, Hariri uh, senior, uh, who was assassinated back in 2005. So the technocrats would represent, of course, those who chose them or, uh, let's say, who selected them uh, to office because they will deal with the status quo, with the political situation. Of course, the names uh, chosen, they are specialists, they are not part of the uh, traditional uh, elite, um, and they will try to make a, uh, a change. Uh, but I don't believe that they would be that successful unless we restructure the whole economy and we uh, get rid of the political elite that have controlled the politics in Lebanon, the corrupt politics uh, of Lebanon, for the past century and not only the past 30 years. So this is in brief, this is my approach to the new government. Of course, uh, I know one or two of them uh, in person. They are nice people. However, I have my reservations on their capacity to lead reforms, uh, especially at a time when the pro-American party in Lebanon is trying to fail them or obstruct their way. The, uh, the, the Western treatment of the demonstrations, which became riots, became real serious conflict, banks being burned and so on, they always seek to imply and sometimes explicitly state that the masses on these demonstrations are against the sectarian uh, nature of the Lebanese state. Uh, yeah. Even though... Actually, the beneficiaries of uh, the scrapping of sectarian quotas and so on would actually be Hezbollah. Hezbollah, uh, if it wanted to, sweep away this sectarian uh, uh, system uh, by force, would actually be doing themselves a favor, but would not be doing Lebanon a favor. Is that fair? Well, uh, my approach to the sectarian system, I'm anti-sectarian, I'm uh, secular. Uh, the sectarian system is uh, the ideological or political uh, organization of a rentier economy controlled by a mercantile elite linked mainly to the West uh, and uh, with, a, let's say, a part of it linked to the uh, Gulf petrodollar. So Hezbollah is not implicated in this game, actually, because the, uh, um, the political elite or the, the political leadership of Hezbollah is not part of the traditional political elite and financial elite in the country. And this is something that we should admit. Uh, regarding the demonstrators, actually, we cannot talk about, uh, of one, uh, let's say, uh, group. Uh, there are too many groups. First, uh, there are uh, those who, and with, with uh, different uh, objectives, actually. Uh, so uh, those uh, who come uh, from a, a liberal uh, uh, background and uh, who favor private sector, 
they are against Hezbollah. Uh, they are supported by the Lebanese forces, which were themselves part of uh, all governments since 2005, at least. Uh, future movement, which had formed uh, which is the party of the prime, uh, former Prime Minister Saad Hariri and his father Rafi Hariri, and which had led the country to this crisis for the past three decades. Uh, of course, the Jumblat uh, faction, which is uh, who is a war uh, lord, uh, implicated in massacres uh, back in, uh, in the 1980s during the civil war. Uh, and of course, there are those who come from uh, a leftist background and uh, who, uh, who don't aim uh, directly against, uh, against Hezbollah, but they direct their uh, uh, anger against uh, the banks. These were the ones to attack the banks, by the way, and against uh, the, the liberal elite that have dominated the country, the mercantile elite, they call for socialist reforms. So there are different objectives. Uh, and uh, the street is a mosaic of all these groups uh, right now. So um, I, I don't believe that all of them uh, agree on uh, eliminating or changing the sectarian system. For the leftists and part of the liberals, they call for that. But for the Lebanese forces, the future movement, the Jumblati faction, and others um, for uh, Amal movement, of course, for uh, the Free Patriotic Movement and for the Falange Party. Uh, I'm, I'm naming uh, opponents and allies of Allah. They all agree on this sectarian formula because it have given them uh, the possibility to access power and to uh, protect their interests, their financial interests, actually. So uh, this is the way I understand Yeah, yeah. No, no, let me ask you, uh, it's been, I have been involved in Lebanon from, from the 1970s, uh, so I know uh, something about it myself. But for the audience, isn't it the case that Lebanon cannot be separate? There were isolationist forces in the 70s that wanted to take Lebanon out of the Arab world as if you could do that like a piece of jigsaw. Uh, the fate of Lebanon is inextricably bound with the fate of Syria, the fate of uh, Palestine, the fate of Iraq, isn't it? Definitely. I, I, I fully believe in this. Uh, actually, what's going on in Lebanon is, in an indirect way, an attempt to destabilize the region one more time, especially at a time when the United States have lost most of its influence in Syria. So it's trying to substitute for this loss uh, in achieving gains, political gains in Iraq and in Lebanon. And this explains the American stance uh, regarding the part of the demonstrators, uh, and uh, whether in Lebanon or in um, Iraq. Uh, well, I believe that uh, this is also part of the, uh, its grand strategy to have uh, this um, uh, deal of the century, uh, which aims at liquida liquidating the, the Palestinian cause and give the Palestinians nothing in return of their involvement in the peace uh, process. But to, uh, for this to happen, they need to um, neutralize the opposition in other countries, including Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. And this explains the chaos that have been prevailing in these countries uh, for the past two decades now. So, uh, yes, will, they I win, will the U.S. That. will the U.S. succeed or fail in your view? Well, I don't believe that they will succeed because we've been through worse situation in the past. The Americans were uh, much stronger back in 2003, and uh, the axis uh, opposing them was much weaker. Now. Uh, uh, well, back in 2003, Syria and Iran were standing alone against the United States and their allies. Uh, <clears throat> now we have the Russians and the Chinese on the side of Syria, uh, Iran, and the Lebanese resistance. The Lebanese resistance itself is much stronger than it was back in 2003, 4, 
five or six during the Israeli aggression against Lebanon. The Palestinian resistance is much stronger. Uh, the Americans and their allies are uh, much weaker than they were before. So, and uh, actually, this this uh, uh, comes at the time or coincides with the the fact that uh, the West in general is declining because there is a shift of the economic hub of the world for the first time since five centuries from the Atlantic Ocean back to the Indian Ocean. And this is giving the upper hand to Russia, China, and Iran, the Eurasian bloc, against the Atlantic bloc. Um, so, uh, and this explains the, uh, the, uh, the violent attempts of the United States to try to make uh, a difference, uh, especially in Lebanon. Uh, they are trying uh, whatever they can, but I don't believe that they will succeed. They should, they could have succeeded before, but they didn't. Uh, now things have changed dramatically. Things have changed. And, yeah. It's a great Bob Dylan I, song, that, by the way. You need to listen to it. Things have changed. Dr. Yeah. Jamal, thank you very much indeed thank you. My for pleasure. joining us on the mother of all talk shows. The poll... Uh, a, should we freeze air links with China because of the spread of the coronavirus? 40% down to B, write a will, 5% steady. C, keep calm and carry on, 55% up to. I'm being backed by my audience. You can vote on my Twitter feed at George Galloway. I've got lots of uh, paper to uh, read. Let me try and make a, a dent uh, into it. Have you seen the video doing the rounds? on social media with a Chinese doctor apparently blowing the lid off the official Chinese figures regarding the virus, i.e. the death toll and casualties to date. Or do you think that the Chinese authorities are being 100% honest about the severity of the virus in their country and the efficiency with which they are dealing with it? I am unable to vote on your Twitter poll, but I am definitely in the keep calm and carry on camp. Also, there is a new six-part documentary series on Netflix called Pandemic, a very timely series that deals with how scientists and doctors would prevent a global flu outbreak. That's from Paul uh, Booker. No, I, I trust uh, China. I believe uh, that China is dealing with this, not just in a good way, but in a quite astounding way, and showing the superiority of the planned economy. But that is just me. Let me take a quick break. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Now, I told you I was setting up a Hall of Fame, and I was going to nominate the first member of it. We haven't actually quite got there yet, and it's a very busy show tonight in any case. Uh, so we'll probably postpone that uh, until next week. We're working on the artwork, what will be a nice Hall of Fame, and you can nominate, and we can uh, have a discussion each week about the uh, nominees. I'm uh, arrogating to myself the right to nominate the first person, but you can uh, nominate everyone else thereafter. I think we'll have 100 maybe uh, in the Hall of Fame, so that means inevitably over the years that I hope this show will run, uh, that some people will have to be moved to, as it were, an annex. But on this day in 1950, India replaced its king as head of state. That was our king. Installed a president, adopted a constitution, and became a republic. Perhaps it will catch on in Britain. I'm not sure it will. It marked the cutting of ties with British rule 
after almost 100 years. The first president, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, served for 12 years. Mr. Nehru became the first democratically elected prime minister in 1952, creating a vast public infrastructure and a closed planned economy. In 1952, on this day, at least 17 British people in Egypt were killed. Hundreds were injured in anti-British riots. Imagine. King Farouk declared martial law in the capital. King Farouk, my mother used to say to me, you're lying there on the couch like King Farouk. I never quite knew what she meant. Was he big, I think he was big, fat and lazy. I never was. Uh, King Farouk declared martial law in the capital, Cairo. A dawn to dusk curfew was imposed, police given orders to shoot on sight. In 1954, of course, the year I was born, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser became president, went on to nationalize the Suez Canal, which led to the invasion by British and French forces and Israeli forces to take back control of the canal. The US quietly forced the invaders to go home. Changed days, huh? In 1998, on this day, US President Bill Clinton denied having sex with that woman, the 24-year-old former White House aide Monica Olejinsky. Of course, he was lying. In a TV address, with his fist clenched and his voice shaking, he said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And it was all, of course, a pack of lies, although he sought to uh, reduce it to a definition of what you mean by sex. Good luck with that one. Uh, well, we know how it turned out. He was impeached, but was eventually cleared by senators of perjury and obstruction of justice. I have myself an encounter uh, with Miss Lewinsky. Uh, in the uh, run-up to the Iraq war, uh, I was using the metaphor that the, I'm all for a special relationship between Britain and the United States, just not the kind of special relationship that Miss Lewinsky had with President Clinton, with the junior partner uh, always on their knees. And this was a very effective metaphor, so effective that one day in the corridors of power, Tony Blair asked me to stop using it. He said that it was demeaning not just to him, uh, which is fair enough, but demeaning to the country and uh, Her Majesty and uh, so on. Anyway, foolishly, I agreed to stop using it, and I did for some weeks. But in those days, I was speaking three, two, three times every day uh, in the run-up to the war. And one day in the afternoon, I was at the London School of Economics, and it was a packed hall, and I was talking about the rush to war uh, with Iraq. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why, I used this metaphor again. I said, I'm in favor of a special relationship. My great-grandmother was an American, the only American in the 19th century to emigrate from America to Scotland when thousands were sailing in the other direction. I just don't want, I said, a special relationship like the one that Miss Lewinsky had with President Clinton, etc., etc., at which point someone leapt up from the audience and said it was particularly crass of you to make those remarks. As Miss Lewinsky is not just a student at the London School of Economics, she's sitting in the fifth row of this very meeting, at which point Miss Lewinsky bolted the course. I did apologize to her. I had no wish to embarrass her, uh, but there you go. Anyway, on this week, it was a tumultuous week in history. Three days earlier, on January 23rd, 1973, President Nixon announced a Vietnam peace deal. Ha! On January 27th, as I've said earlier, the Auschwitz death camp was liberated by the Red Army. Nearly 3,000 survivors of various nationalities were questioned, and on the basis of their evidence, a report estimated that 4 million people had perished there between 1941 and early 1945. Just think about that. And on January 28th, in 1986, the American Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, killing all seven astronauts on board. The Challenger disaster was a severe blow to the American space program. There were no further manned flights until September 1988. That's uh, more than two years later. Then on February 1st, 2003, 
A second space shuttle, Columbia, exploded as it was attempting re-entry after a 16-day mission. Again, all seven astronauts on board, including the first Israeli in space, were killed. That's on this day. Uh, next week, that will be uh, replaced with a Hall of Fame discussion and uh, the elevation into our Hall of Fame uh, will begin. Okay, the poll is still running. You can do it on my Twitter feed. Should we freeze air links with China? A, B, write a will. C, keep calm and carry on. Uh, George, I love this section with Chris. That's Chris Hedges. But I think he's far too forgiving of Elizabeth Warren. Not only has she repeatedly worked with the mainstream media to spread misinformation about Bernie Sanders, she has been taking advice from Hillary Clinton behind the scenes. Hence her 11th hour shift from Bernie imitator to the first woman president. She is in this race to help Biden and be his vice president. Thank you. Thank you, John. I happen to agree with every word of that. Let's take a quick break. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, when I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Only on Sputnik Radio. Now, Patrick Henningsen of uh, the 21st Century Wire is a global analyst, a TV and radio broadcaster, a writer, a man of note and a good friend of the show. He's been here before and it's always interesting to hear what he's got to say, not least because he attended a very interesting meeting in the Houses of Parliament this week and he's here to tell us about it. Patrick, welcome back uh, to the show. This is the Duma affair which, as I said earlier, almost brought the world to war and is now widely regarded as having been based uh, entirely on a hoax. Uh, that I don't know which is more surprising, uh, that this hoax uh, was perpetrated or that the media have conspired entirely to suppress the evidence that proves it to be a hoax. How about you? Well, the, last week was a big week. Two, two important things happened. The first was a UN Security Council uh, meeting on this very subject uh, that featured one of the whistleblowers from the OPCW. His name is Ian Henderson. He was on the ground team that investigated initially with Duma. And uh, that was in the ARIA format, so it was an informal meeting because obviously the, uh, not all of the members wanted this to happen, uh, but Russia was one of the countries pushing for it. And it was uh, stunning, and I, I might add that you know, these whistleblowers are being attacked. They're being attacked in the press. They're being attacked by uh, political figures. They're being attacked by uh, organizations like Bellingcat. So that was on Monday. And then on Wednesday, there was a meeting in the Houses of Parliament 
uh, the House of Commons uh, room. This was booked by a Labour MP uh, who I believe is the uh, shadow minister for defence, Fabian Hamilton. And uh, he wanted to uh, allow uh, people to air uh, the evidence right now, and that was presented by the working group. Good for him. That, that took quite some courage to do that. Yeah, so uh, he, he, he believed that uh, the, uh, inter the leaked report should get a fair hearing. Uh, so that was presented. There were military figures there, former head of the SAS, uh, uh, retired Major General John Holmes. Uh, he chaired the meeting, actually. Uh, there were lords there, a few MPs, uh, mainstream press, and a few activists as well. So what uh, the findings of this, the presentation was stunning, okay? And what it, what it proved beyond any doubt is that the executive at the OPCW intervened uh, between the interim report and the final report to alter, radically alter the findings and conclusions of the ground investigation team. That includes manipulation of data, uh, expunging expert opinion, analysis, to give a very different conclusion, to give the conclusion in the final report that chlorine was used, that there was a chemical attack featuring chlorine. Sarin had already been ruled out because it just wasn't present. But there was still this uh, hanging issue of chlorine. Now, after seeing this presentation and the evidence from the whistleblowers, it's clear that there was no chlorine attack by any honest evaluation of this. Now, the problem is uh, the, uh, UN, the UN has put together the OPCW under a charter of neutrality. That was violated as well. U.S. agents, unknown, uh, putting direct pressure inside the offices of the OPCW. So uh, this is a, you're probably familiar with this, George, with uh, uh, UN SCOM and UN MOVIC, how the United States effectively destroyed. They colonized the supposedly United Nations neutral uh, practical uh, organizations, turned them into ideological weapons. And destroyed them at the end of the day. Indeed. Rendered them uh, useless, really, for the, uh, the mission that they initially had. This is exactly what's happening to the OPCW right now, and this is what has happened. The, the takeaway of this that's really important is that there's two war crimes were committed. The, the, the U.S., France, the, uh, the U.K. launched an airstrike based on intelligence they claimed they had, which clearly wasn't there. They did so to preempt an investigation. By, by striking before uh, any investigation could be done. That automatically puts political pressure on the actual process of investigating before it even happens. As well as contaminating the site. As, as well. And, and so this is a, a, a compounded problem. So there's the striking uh, another UN member state uh, in an undeclared act of aggression. That's a war crime. Then you have what staging of dead bodies this is something that was flagged up by the ground investigation team this is this is a serious war crime we're talking about between 30 and 40 uh, um, uh, victims yeah in this. so who killed them this is an unanswered question and so we have a situation where a, a body like the OPCW goes in and according to the executive how they sanitize this report they don't offer uh, any uh, uh, any inquiry into any alternative hypothesis other than there was a chemical weapon attack that took place, when in fact there's a number of other possibilities, more likely possibilities, that the terrorists who occupied Duma at the time uh, have uh, staged. The ev there is evidence of staging there that canisters were placed in position and not dropped. Well, I've seen a picture of uh, one of these canisters uh, that Ian Henderson, a British uh, engineer, a technician, of unimpeachable credentials says uh, was neither fired as a projectile nor dropped from an aircraft. It had been laid there to be photographed and to spill its uh, potentially deadly content. How devastating is that? It's incredible. That's this is a piece of information from a man with no axe to grind, no motive, no ulterior motive at all, except getting his motive is getting the truth out and it's been completely blacked out of the mainstream British media. That's the you made, you made an important point, George. These are multiple whistleblowers. Normally, you have one whistleblower who comes public, and that's a big uh, event, that's a big scandal. We have multiple whistleblowers, so clearly, there's no political motivation here. This is purely on ethical and professional whistleblowing basis. And I'm, I might add that Jonathan Steele 
who is a veteran journalist of uh, high regard, a former Middle East correspondent for The Guardian. He also attended and presented at this meeting at the House of Commons. And he made some very strong remarks regarding the press's handling of this, or should I say, uh, media blackout of this. And uh, he submitted pieces on this to mainstream publications. And uh, I'm paraphrasing him, but he also has said this publicly, that uh, he was turned down by a number of publications because they didn't want to advance the Russian or Syrian position <laughs> on the issue. So where are we in terms of... Uh, our well, you're a journalist. You tell me. I mean, how does this work? Uh, are journalists threatened? Are they bribed? How are they twisted into... I mean, especially British, the British media. Here we have a British scientist like Dr. David Kelly saying something not like Dr. Kelly, God rest his soul, uh, privately and off the record, but publicly, in Ian Henderson's case, publicly saying, you've been fed a crock. And it almost caused a major war. How is that not a story in British uh, media? Even better than that, his findings were ordered to be purged from the OPCW's internal archive. That, by definition, is a cover-up. No question about it. So from a journalist, I mean, how much of a scent do you need for a story? You've got the cover-up. You've got war crimes. Uh, you've got whistleblowers who are being uh, demonized. Who speak English and they're British <laughs> and they're here. You know that old famous old book, anyone, anyone around here being raped and speaks English? Uh, that was uh, uh, um, uh, meant to be a satire on how actually Western journalists were only interested if you could speak English and uh, if uh, the crime that had been committed was uh, fit to lead the front page. Here you have a story with everything that has been systematically, uh, not just ignored, as you say, but expunged. Um, maybe it's the chilling effect of what happened to our friend, Julian Assange. He blew the whistle, and look where he is now. That's the intention of the treatment of Julian, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, any time you have evidence of war crimes or exculpatory evidence that could have exonerated, for instance, the Syrian government in these chemical attack in Douma in April of 2018, that's not any different than the type of stuff that WikiLeaks made public on multiple occasions uh, that are, you know, war crimes that are definitely in the public interest. To bury exculpatory evidence and then launch a war based on a, a false premise of uh, guilt, uh, a, a false pretext of intelligence that's not there. Again, this is no different, I think, than Iraq. It's a very different configuration of events, but effectively it's the same process. Patrick, let me take a quick break. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Now, uh, it's a red-letter day when the hardened convicts of Belmarsh Prison uh, have got a better idea of justice than the British judicial authorities. Yet they have played a decisive role in springing Julian Assange, at least from the horrors of uh, solitary confinement. That must have gladdened your heart. Yeah, this, this was something, um, this was a combination of an effort uh, led by his fellow inmates, uh, but also by the campaigners and uh, Julian Assange's defense team uh, to take him out of what is effectively unofficial 
unofficial solitary confinement. And if you look closer at the prison regulations and the actual uh, what governs Her Majesty's prisons, you'll see that the, there is, uh, they denied that they do solitary confinement, but in effect, Julian Assange has been confined for over 22 hours a day. That by definition, by all international standards, is solitary confinement. They're able to do that through a kind of bureaucratic fiat by making unofficially, he was uh, held in uh, the health a unit, a bell marsh. Now, uh, so it's not officially sanctioned as solitary on paper. And by doing that, they've been able to kind of do a runaround on sort of accountability of what the expectations are for a prisoner being held in those types of conditions. It's a very uh, uh, complicated maze of um, regulations and bureaucracy, but we have actually uh, done a nice analysis of this, which is up on 21st Century Wire right now. I'll read that. Um, but of course, the impact of the unofficial solitary confinement is compounded by, I mean, okay, Julian's been late or not turned up for his court dates because the prison didn't deliver him uh, to the court. Uh, he has had an absurdly limited amount of time with his lawyers when he's facing the trial of the century. Uh, his lawyers, instead of being, as in any logical uh, process allowed to spend all day every day with him preparing his case have been uh, restricted to a ridiculous uh, ridiculously suppressed amount of access to the to the prisoner um, is that now likely to change I see that the uh, hearing has been postponed by a month are we beginning glacially to see uh, a change do you think in the attitude to Julian I'll tell you why I ask the U.S. has just refused to extradite the wife of a U.S. intelligence officer to Britain uh, to answer uh, to the uh, accusation that she killed through negligence uh, a young English boy, a cyclist. The U.S. has just, by fiat, denied this uh, extradition while we are being asked to send Julian Assange in the other direction. Do you see, as I do, maybe the beginning of a window in which Julian can escape this dreaded fate? It depends how much uh, people in this country uh, are outraged uh, by this uh, person claiming diplomatic immunity, which, by the way, if you look at the whole reason for diplomatic immunity in history... She doesn't have. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't meant for these types of of situations. But uh, back to, to Julian Assange, um, it, the, the effort to get him released is constantly going on behind the scenes. Uh, and so he is uncharged, he is unconvicted. He's being held as a, in, in a Category A fashion, even though he's not a Category A prisoner. Uh, so in, if you compare, contrast his treatment to Tommy Robinson, who was in Belmarsh uh, just a few months ago, was given pretty much unlimited visitation. Uh, it was unlimited use of the telephone, according to reports, between uh, you know, 9 and 11 every morning. Uh, and you, you compare that to Julian Assange, as you rightly said, this is the most important case in freedom of the press in the early 21st century. This has global implications for every single journalist, media outlet, not just that, but just the right of uh, to be able to have a free press in whatever country you're in. The United States is not going to come and render your journalist and then take him to the U.S. And according to WikiLeaks uh, editor Christian Harferson, he said he's looked at the documentation uh, that, uh, from, the, from the legal team and said that the United States is attempting to strip Julian Assange of any First Amendment protections when he arrives in the U.S. So imagine that, going to render a journalist from another country, bring him for a trial in the United States on the mainland, not, not Guantanamo Bay, on the mainland, and then say that you no longer have... First Amendment protections, and not only that, your legal team was not allowed to be able to speak to the uh, media. So there's uh, special administrative uh, measures, they call it, uh, media blackout. So that's treating him like a Gitmo, black hooded, you know, terrorist in a orange jumpsuit. Extraordinary offshore. rendition. Extraordinary rendition. So this is a total abrogation of the First Amendment. Uh, and so this is happening under this president, under this administration. Meanwhile, they're impeaching, they're trying to impeach the president for what doesn't uh, uh, rise for to... a phone call to the Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, to hold up an arms, uh, an arms shipment to, uh, to the Ukraine. So, and, and this is a real crisis, potentially, 
uh, a very dangerous precedent indeed. And um, uh, where is America? Where are the Democrats? Where are the Republicans? Where are the constitutionalists, the libertarians, the paleoconservatives? Where are they? Well, and, and look at Chelsea Manning, a thousand dollars a day fine, not allowed out to attend her mother's funeral, uh, having already served her time, now being behind bars for refusing to testify in front of a grand jury against Julian Assange. What a mess this all is. Where are the feminists? Where are the trans rights campaigners? Why aren't they out fighting for Chelsea Manning? Why aren't the free speech brigade, the libertarians, the, the leftists, the liberals, where are they? How is it come it's only thee and me standing outside <laughs> Belmarsh with a handful of others? Yeah, in America, well, there are good people. I think the American Civil Liberties Union and uh, there's very good legal uh, people that are lining up to uh, tackle this case. But I'm talking about a handful of people, but a very dedicated handful of people very. that could, that could uh, draw more support. And it, this could become a bigger issue. The problem is, George, I, I am left to ask the question of do, how much do people really care about their rights? Um, is, is, the, is the impetus for this so far in the rearview mirror of uh, civilization in the 21st century that it no longer is a priority to, to basically stand on the front line when, in fact, this is the moment, this is the watershed moment where you're looking at it? It's like the life of Brian when they, mm -hmm. uh, they're meeting and the, in the, they come in and say, Reg, it's happening, it's really happening. And they say, oh, you know, not, not now, we're busy, you know, we're talking. Well, always look on the bright side of life, as the song says. There's an election coming up. Will that change anything on the Assange case? Will Trump, if he's re-elected, uh, take steps to stop this? Because he actually used uh, WikiLeaks and Julian. Uh, he quoted their stuff innumerable times in his denunciation of the Iraq war and so on. Uh, if he's re-elected, will he stop this? And if he's not re-elected and Bernie Sanders is elected or Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren, will they stop it? This is a good question. This is easy. This is easy leverage if you want to take Donald Trump to task on an important issue and hit the conservatives in the heart because they normally uh, bandy about the Constitution, uh, the conservatives and Republicans. So. Will they do that? And this is the question is, you know, what is the uh, allegiance, blind allegiance to the five eyes, to the security state? This is a bipartisan problem in Washington. The strongest voices are Rand Paul or Tulsi Gabbard. She's being absolutely uh, buried by the media in her presidential run. Clearly, she has uh, taken a very clear position on this case. She's the only one who is demanding uh, the Assange case be dropped. Ber Bernie Sanders has as well, but it's not... It, it, this requires some leadership and a little bit of energy uh, to really take, take Donald Trump to task on this. And it's an easy knockout punch. But the question is, will they do it? And if they don't, that really says a lot about the state of politics right now in the United States. Because the First Amendment, every other right in the Bill of Rights is built on top of that. So if that's uh, compromised in any way... What about my first point? If Trump is re-elected, might he do something? Might he pardon Julian, for example? That would be fantastic if he did. So maybe the pressure would be off with re-election, not having to, you know, toe, toe the line with the neoconservatives, for instance, show a little bit of independence, have a legacy as a somebody who's d done something as a... To defend the Constitution. A, a defender of freedom, a real defender of freedom. Mm. That's a good question, George. I really hope so. Uh, I really hope so. But it's not looking very good at the moment. Uh, what, what will it take? Will it take egg on the face of the Department of Justice? Will it take a Supreme Court ruling? But how long will that take? How many years? What will happen to Julian Assange in the meantime? Or Chelsea Manning, for instance, who's uh, being extraordinary. You know, yeah. Patrick, it's always a pleasure even to discuss somber issues with you. Patrick Henningsen, 21st Century Wire. I must read. I read it every day. Go to it now. Let me throw it to the news with Emily Horn. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat for America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. 
Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning and I'm looking for what's on the queue for today, I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Ali and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. China is warning the ability of the deadly coronavirus to spread is getting stronger as the number of infected globally rises to more than 2,000. The authorities say little is known about the new virus and they're unclear on the risk posed by it mutating. Some 56 people have died from the virus so far. Several Chinese cities are imposing significant travel restrictions as well. Wuhan, the source of the outbreak, is in effective lockdown. China says the incubation period for the coronavirus can range from 1 to 14 days, and it is infectious during this time. In response to the mounting crisis, containment efforts, which to date have included travel restrictions and the cancellation of major events, are to be ramped up in China. The U.S. is also to evacuate its diplomatic staff from the region and has offered a limited number of seats on the flight out of the country to its citizens at greater risk. Britain is also considering pulling out citizens from the affected areas. China's officials have announced that the sale of all wildlife in the country is now banned. The virus is thought to have originated in animals, but no cause has been officially identified. Next, footage has emerged of a two-year-old girl being rescued from rubble in Turkey after a 6.8 magnitude earthquake. The toddler, who was covered in dust, was pulled free by a rescue worker. At least 31 people have been killed following the quake in the country's east, and it is feared that more than 20 others are still trapped under debris. Next, in southeast Brazil, at least 30 people have died after two days of heavy rain caused flooding and landslides. 17 people are missing and 2,600 people have been moved to safety from their homes. Images show people, including children, swimming through some of the flooded streets. Well, more rain is expected in Minas Gerais, as well as other parts of Brazil, including Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. And the U.S. plane manufacturer Boeing has successfully completed the first flight of the world's largest twin-engine jetliner. It took three attempts to get the plane off of the ground as the first two planned tests were abandoned due to high winds. While the aircraft, which is 77 meters long and can seat more than 400 passengers, took off from a runway just outside of Seattle on the U.S. west coast. Four hours later, it landed at the historic Boeing Field, not far from rows of 7 37 MAX planes left grounded after two fatal crashes triggered safety concerns. The new Boeing model, which will be officially known as the 777-9, also has folding wingtips that mean it can fit its wings into the same parking bays as other jets. The plane is expected to enter service in 2021. 
And the outgoing Chief of Staff of Israel's Defence Forces, Gadi Eisenkot, has acknowledged for the first time that Israel had provided weaponry to Syrian rebel groups during the country's seven-year civil war. Until today, Israel has officially always said that it had given humanitarian aid to Syrian opposition groups across the border while denying or refusing to comment on reports it had supplied them with arms as well. However, Eisenkot is now admitting Israel had provided light weapons to the rebel groups along the border, saying it was for self-defense. Israel's supply of weapons to these opposition groups had been reported for years, both by the Syrian army and by opposition groups, but it was never confirmed by Israel officials. And finally, the 62nd Annual Grammy Awards will be taking place in Los Angeles tonight. Billed as music's biggest night, the ceremony is more like music's longest day, with festivities kicking off at lunchtime in L.A. and stretching out into the night. Pop star Lizzo leads the nominations with eight in total, including album and song of the year. The forthcoming Bond film singer Billie Eilish and Lil Nas X are close behind with six each. All three represent a new vanguard of pop charismatic and pop conformist with songs that defined the last 12 months. And U.S. rapper YG, who was due to perform at the Grammys, has been released on bail after being arrested for alleged robbery. The performer, whose real name is Keenon Jackson, was let out by police after being held on a $250,000 bail. He's due in court on Tuesday for an arraignment where charges will be formally put to him and he will be asked to enter a plea. Well, that's all for Sputnik News. I'm Emily Horn. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Now this has been a night for breaking news. Uh, Sputnik are reporting that three rockets have struck the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. One hitting a dining facility. It's thought one hit its restaurant, Al Arabiya, are saying. How extraordinary uh, is that? What will be the response uh, to that? Whose rockets were they? Who fired them? All adds to the tinderbox that is the Middle East. And the Israel-Palestine question, of course, lies at the heart of that. And it lay at the heart of the martyring of the best Labour MP. They're in a, a leadership election uh, right now. Uh, if Chris Williamson had not been expelled, suspended, expelled out of the Labour Party, destroyed in the uh, Labour Party, he would have been a leading candidate, maybe the leading candidate, to be the next leader of the Labour Party. He was the most faithful uh, to the line of the previous leader, Jeremy Corbyn. He was an effective communicator, a true believer in socialist politics. And it's my view uh, that they singled him out for destruction precisely to stop him ever becoming the leader or deputy leader of the Labour Party. That's just my personal view. Uh, it's not one that everyone has to accept, but what they would have to accept is that Chris Williamson was driven out of the Labour Party on an entirely bogus prospectus. He joins me now. He's no longer a Labour MP or an MP at all, but he's still a very important political figure, and I'm glad to say I can count him as a friend. Chris Williamson, welcome uh, on to the Sputnik. I think it's the second time you've been on the Mother of All talk show, so welcome back. Um, first of all, your views on the uh, current state of affairs in the Middle East, before I ask you uh, about the Labour Party. You've just heard about this three rockets landing on the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. You know of the continuing uh, turmoil in Palestine under occupation and siege. It's a pretty grim uh, 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 picture that we see when we look to that area, isn't it? 
Very much so, George. And uh, we're living in very troubled times. Very serious uh, uh, escalation, it seems to me, that we are seeing as a consequence of the bellicose sort of foreign policy that's being pursued by Donald Trump's administration. And if ever there was a time where we needed calm heads, uh, if ever there was a time where we needed a Jeremy Corbyn-led Labour government, frankly, it's now to try to you know, bring some calm to the to the situation. Now, I fear for the potential escalation that may uh, ensue to an even greater extent than it already has, and potentially could spiral out of control. And uh, it's very, very worrying indeed. And uh, I can only hope for the best, um, but I fear for the worst. Now, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was a lifelong supporter of the Palestinian people. Uh, he raised the question in Parliament about what now turns out to be the bogus chemical weapons attack on Douma. He opposed the Iraq war. He opposed the war against Libya, Afghanistan, and so on. Maybe that's why he's no longer uh, going to be the Prime Minister of Britain. They were pretty desperate to stop him in the end, weren't they? Oh, they certainly were. There were a whole range of forces that were working against Jeremy's uh, leadership, and uh, not least of which was his position on developing a, an ethical foreign policy. And, you know, he was somebody who spent his entire life in Parliament, really, uh, speaking out on these matters. And, um, you know, the world would have been a whole lot better had we had a, a sort of Corbyn-led Labour government, a government that, uh, you know, did treat some of these accusations which are thrown around with, with some degree of scepticism, I indeed spoke out uh, myself at the time, and all Jeremy was doing was merely, you know, querying whether there was evidence, for example, in relation to the attack that you referred to in Douma. It turns out that both Jeremy and I were absolutely right, but we were pilloried at the time for having the temerity to, you know, pose those questions about what had actually happened there. And I, I remember going on to uh, some of the broadcast, mainstream broadcast media and, and, and quoting people like Robert Fisk, who had been on the ground there, and he was himself you know, sort of challenging what had actually happened that he'd spoken to eyewitnesses, uh, all of whom were very sceptical about the, the, the situation. But it, it, it um, you know, it was uh, accepted as a fact that uh, there had been a chemical weapons attack which justified the, the, the airstrike uh, that, that, that ensued. And, and clearly now we know. And what is really, really troubling, of course, is the OPCW, which were previously, uh, I always felt unimpeachable, maybe naively, uh, but this, of course, has called into question their uh, sort of uh, impartiality. And, uh, you know, when you can't rely on the uh, reportage from an organisation like the OPCW, then I think we are in a very, very uh, sort of unfortunate situation, to say the least. Not the least of the reasons why Corbyn isn't Prime Minister today, or indeed uh, back in 2017, is the fact that he was surrounded on all sides in Parliament by people who wished him ill. Uh, in some cases, wished him political death, in one or two cases, actual uh, death. And that's the heart of the matter when one looks at the Labour Party, isn't it? That you can have however many members uh, in the country committed to however uh, progressive politics, as long as you've got a, a parliamentary Labour Party that will be guaranteed to kill those politics and, if necessary, end the career of anyone espousing them, you're not going to get anywhere, are you? No, I, I mean, I wouldn't say I've given up hope with the Labour Party. I've been a, you know, associated with the Labour Party, a member of it, for getting on for 44 years before I eventually uh, was forced to resign in order to fight the uh, last uh, election, albeit unsuccessfully. Um, but I set my stall out to try and support Jeremy as strongly as I could because I believed in the agenda that he was uh, putting forward. It's an agenda which I think was overwhelmingly popular, not just with Labour Party members, but with the, the country as a whole. And he was clearly being frustrated, sabotaged by the vast majority of the parliamentary Labour Party. So I embarked upon a, a democracy roadshow with a view to trying to get greater democracy into the Labour Party to give the grassroots members who the party belongs to, let's remember, it doesn't belong to the Parliamentary Labour Party or the bureaucrats, it belongs to the members. Well, and in theory, in theory, Chris, in practice, that's not well, so. 
if you're absolutely right, George, the, the people that really wield the power are all the parliamentary Labour Party and, and the bureaucracy. And that's completely wrong. And obviously I was singled out as somebody who needed to be removed because I was getting a lot of support, I think, from, from the grassroots membership who did feel that, yes, this party was their party and they did have an absolute right to have, for example, a say over who should be the Labour candidate in every constituency. This isn't extraordinary. It happens in every other democracy around the world. It happens it's, it's in, ha happening in America right now, in Iowa, this coming week. Very much so, yes. I, you know, even the president of the US has to go through a, an endorsement process. The SNP in, in the UK, they, in Scotland, they, they have to, their uh, members of parliament have to go through an endorsement process. So I don't see why Labour MP should feel that they are in some sort of uh, privileged position where they're not required to have that in process, it, it put in place as it were. But I was sort of portrayed as some sort of uh, revolutionary extremist uh, for suggesting that we have a semblance of democracy in the Labour Party. And I was particularly disturbed. And the reason why I really pushed for greater democracy was after what had happened to Jeremy in this first period as leader and the absolute unwillingness to accept that decision. The overwhelming majority uh, of members had voted for Jeremy as the leader, the biggest mandate that any Labour leader had ever achieved in the party's history. And um, they just weren't prepared to accept it. And then they mounted a coup, as you'd be well aware. And uh, from that moment forward, I felt that it was absolutely essential that Labour members of Parliament were made accountable to their members uh, and that they had to then account for their, for their actions because they were clearly working against the interests of the party and the interests of the country, to be honest with you, because if ever there was a need, as I've already said, for a Corbyn and Labour government, it's right now, not just in foreign policy terms, but if you look at the domestic agenda and the, the, you know, the dreadful levels of poverty that we've got in this country, 14 million people living in poverty in the fifth richest economy in the world, it's an absolute travesty. And uh, they were not prepared to accept that democratic decision of the members. They were determined to prevent a modest socialist programme being implemented and certainly didn't want to have any truck with an ethical foreign policy. Uh, and they set out to destroy Jeremy, to just break him as a man and, and anybody else who got in his way. So we know hundreds, thousands indeed of Jeremy's, if you like, I've re referred to them as, uh, as Jeremy's Praetorian Guard, the basically socialist, anti-racist socialist in the Labour Party. A number of them Jewish, anti-Zionist uh, Jewish members of the party were, were, were targeted. People like uh, Jackie Walker, for example, a black Jewish woman who was, was targeted. The other people like Cyril Chilson, who is uh, the son of two Holocaust survivors. Uh, absolutely despicable uh, the way in which these people were uh, traduced. Jewish members of the party uh, and, and um, sort of demonised as some sort of anti-Semite. And then they were expelled, many of them, uh, unsuspended for bringing the party into disrepute. And it isn't just the political consequences, George, which uh, I'm concerned about. I know several people, and there may be others who I'm, I'm unaware of or haven't spoken to, but, but there are a good number of people I'm aware of who've had their careers destroyed by this witch hunt, by these smears, where they've lost their employment. And um, a number of the people, I mean, in professional occupations, teachers, I know two teachers who've lost their job as a result of these accusations, these false accusations that have been levelled against them, that they're somehow anti semites These are pro-Palestinian campaigners, you know, anti-racist campaigners. And uh, I set out to not just democratise the party, but also I felt it was essential that we showed solidarity with people who were falsely accused, that we support each other. As socialists, we believe that an injury to one is an injury to all. At least ways I thought that, but regrettably, there's not a single member of parliament who lifted a finger to either stand by me or stand by anybody else who was thrown under the bus by these this avalanche. Well, look, if it, uh, it didn't work, we're agreed on that. Uh, it's failed, uh, is a blunter way of putting it. Uh, it's not going to, if it didn't happen under Corbyn, it's not going to happen under lesser uh, Corbyns, is it? It's, uh, the leadership election is on now. Uh, whether Keir Starmer, who's the bookies' favourite, and streets ahead in nominations and so on, uh, or even Rebecca Long Bailey, she's not going to stand up to the forces that Jeremy Corbyn failed to stand up to, is she? Well, I mean, I think we shouldn't even be in this situation now where we're having a leadership election. I think two strategic blunders were, were made uh, earlier, well, I must say earlier this year, last year, in fact, obviously towards the back end of last year. One was to agree to an election in the middle of winter, 
Uh, and secondly, was to go to the country on the premise that we supported a second referendum on Brexit. So we shouldn't even be here. That was a terrible error of judgment by the shadow cabinet. I think Jeremy was uh, bounced into that uh, uh, policy position. Uh, had he, you know, opposed a, a election and, and, and forced uh, Boris Johnson onto the, the back foot, as I think he was, uh, and forced him to continue to wrestle with the difficult situation that he found himself in, not having a majority in the House of Commons, and then enabled an election to take place either after uh, the, you know, the Brexit decision had eventually been taken, or indeed gone to the country on the basis of saying that uh, we would get Brexit done as well, but we would have a people's Brexit rather than a banker's Brexit. But we are where we are, and I, I now agree with you that I don't think, uh, given the, Jeremy's inability really to to, or a willingness, or whatever it was, to stand up to the to the haters, to the merchants of uh, of, of smears, that uh, none of the other candidates standing now are a patch on Jeremy, in my opinion, and certainly won't either stand up to him. I and mean, we only have to look at the board of deputies, ten pledges, for example, and the leadership candidates candidates were all of them falling over themselves to sign up to. Him. This is outrageous, and you know, an external organisation dictating to the. Labour Party, what it should do in relation to saying, for example, that they had to sign up to, and they have done, anybody who had the temerity to defend somebody who is suspended or being expelled, even if you believe, as I did, uh, that uh, people have been falsely accused, that they should, as happened to me, be automatically suspended and then uh, removed from the party as well. I mean, this is outrageous. And yet they signed up uh, to this, uh, uh, the, 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 these 10 pledges, and uh, that can't be right. Uh, and given that they're all, you know, their willingness to, to do that, to capitulate in that way, with no resistance whatsoever, I think is a huge error of judgment. And uh, another thing which worked against us in the election was that uh, a large section of the Labour Party's membership had been demoralised, had been even suspended from the, from the party. Many people have walked away in disgust at the way in which grassroots members were being treated. And that isn't going to change any time soon. And I predict that whoever wins the election, there will be a further purge and uh, hundreds, if not thousands, more will be removed from the party. So what, what are you going to do now, Chris? What's this grassroots movement you're talking about? Yes, well, that's what I'm just about to go on to, George. Actually, I think what we need to do, and what I'm now focusing my attention on, is, is seeing can we build a, an alternative grassroots movement to do a number of things, really. It's not at this stage setting up another party. Um, I still have uh, some hope that, uh, you know, the Labour Party can be turned around, that that may be a forlorn hope, but uh, let's see how things develop. But I do think there is a need for a grassroots movement to do a number of things. I think, one, we need to build capacity in communities and learn a lesson from, you know, groups like the uh, Panthers, for example. As the state withdrew from provision, as, we, as, we, as they witnessed in the States, of course, where the state failed to provide any... Uh, modicum of decent public services, and we're seeing the state in this country increasingly withdrawing from uh, uh, public service provision, then I think we need to build an alternative infrastructure to enable communities or to help communities, you know, defend each other and support each other and build that alternative in infrastructure uh, uh, outside the state, if you like. But at the same time as doing that, building a sense of political consciousness, because there are a number of voluntary organisations operating around the country at the moment, but there is no politics with that. You know, there is no discussion about why is it that we've got, uh, uh, I don't know what the number is actually, but I think it's well over a thousand food banks now in the country. Why is that in the fifth biggest economy in the world? And I think we need to raise that political consciousness as well. But then the other thing I think is important is that uh, as well as building that uh, uh, capacity, you know, building that infrastructure outside the state provision, we need to be looking at you know, how do we communicate with each other? How can we sort of bring people together so that they don't feel isolated. So I think there's a case for building an alternative uh, media. I mean, we're already seeing that happening now, and I'm speaking to uh, colleagues up and down the country about the potential for community radio, for example. I know there's talk about trying to launch a new uh, left tabloid newspaper, for example, but I think we need to find ways of bypassing the mainstream media because that clearly isn't doing its job in terms of uh, you know, providing information to uh, people on, on what is really happening in the country. And then well, the you bypassed it tonight, Chris. Uh, well, how have... do people get in touch with you to uh, see how they can help you? 
Well, they can contact me uh, via my uh, Twitter handle. They can direct message me on that, which is uh, Darby Chris W at Darby Chris W, or they can email me at DarbyVegan at gmail.com, or they can ring me. My mobile number is 07966 457796. I'll be more than happy to, to speak to anyone uh, and any, uh, everyone who's interested in, in joining together because, look, you know, there's more of us than them, and I think uh, there's a range of things that we can do as well as building capacity and looking at how we can communicate better with each other. But there's also a case for street protest, and we need to learn a lesson from the Gilets Jaunes. And I'm looking to launch a conference uh, a bit later on this year, and we're hoping to have some speakers uh, from the, the Gilets Jaunes uh, there to talk about their movement, how successful they've been in pushing back uh, Macron's uh, agenda. So even though we're out of government, even though the Tories uh, have an 80-seat majority, we, we mustn't give up, uh, and I think we have to keep hope alive. And uh, the way that we can do that, I think, is by working together, rediscovering that sense of social solidarity and giving people the tools to, to work together in unity in order to uh, fight back and to build our capacity, support each other, with a view to bringing new working-class leaders through. There's things that we should be doing, Labour councils could be doing right now, legislations on the statute board that enables, brought in by the Tories, ironically, that would enable local authorities to introduce, for example, a progressive council tax to stop the Tory cuts at a stroke. You'd have to go to a referendum to get buy-in to that. But what you'd be able to do is to either cut or, or freeze the council tax for the overwhelming majority in, in, in most boroughs up and down the country and build in some potential for growth in public services. And we should also be embarking upon Labour authorities, particularly, or any authority for that matter, but certainly Labour authorities, on an, on an enormous council house building programme. There is no cap now on the housing revenue account. So why aren't we having a renaissance in council housing in this country? Why aren't we embracing the, uh, the legislation brought in by Eric Pickles, of all people, the Local Government Finance Act, gives local authorities that ability to introduce a progressive council tax. So that's the sort of thing I think I would like to see happening, what I'm hoping through this movement, that will bring new working class leaders who have got the, um, the determination, if you like, to ensure that they speak, to, speak truth to power and get into positions where they can actually speak for the working class uh, communities that they represent, rather than going native and just um, and just simply uh, accepting the, the status quo, which we've seen far too many councillors and certainly MPs uh, over a good number of years now, not really doing anything to uh, change the balance of power in this country. And uh, that's what we should be aiming for. Uh, I was hoping we would achieve that with the, the Corbyn project. We didn't get there, um, but we mustn't give up. I think we can still achieve it. Chris Williamson, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. And uh, let me see, there's another uh, poll. Uh, following the Davos summit, should Greta Thunberg, A, go back to school, B, stand for parliament, C, be given a Nobel Prize? That's a controversial one. Following the Davos summit, should Greta go back to school, stand for parliament, be given a Nobel Prize? Here's the actual shot I made this week on Davos. Take a look at this. The devils are descending on Davos in Switzerland. It's the annual convocation of the richest and most powerful people within the pale, within the dictatorship of the prevailing orthodoxy. It's the greatest concentration of private jets anywhere in the world, all flying to the last snow in the world. Half a million pounds annual membership fee. The richer you are, the higher up the mountain your chalet is. Perhaps there will be divine intervention and a tiny little avalanche will start at the top and sweep them in the end all away. Some of the devils are predictable. Uh, Donald Trump, for example. Tony Blair, fresh from his new privatization drive in Angola in Africa, having already completed it in the north of the continent in Egypt. He'll be there presiding as the evil genius, perhaps with a cat on his lap stroking it in an all-white chalet environment. Lord Peter Mandelson, Jeffrey Epstein's friend, he'll probably be there. The hypocrites 
are gathering to discuss climate change when their economic and political system based on the degradation of the earth, the exploitation of its natural resources, punctuated by periodic descent into devastating war, are the biggest climate change actors to be found anywhere. Of course, they put a bit of lipstick on the affair by bringing little Greta Thunberg. Does she never go to school? She is in Davos too, sharing a platform with Donald Trump, who's busily planning to blow up the world. The hypocrites pretend to complain about that degradation of the earth, but actually all they're trying to do is preserve their own economic and political hegemony. They are against the industrialization of poor countries whilst rolling around in the luxury of the proceeds of their own industrialization. They believe that private is good and public is bad and that somehow an agglomeration of the most rapacious brigands, buccaneers, privateers on the earth can be looked to to provide a solution to the world's profound problems. Those that speak for a different point of view, a real alternative point of view, not the cosmetic changes proposed by those that dress themselves from head to foot in green and veganism, those who stand against the hegemony of the prevailing economic and political orthodoxy, they are locked out. Not that many of them would be that keen to go. The conspicuous consumption, the livery, the caviar and champagne bill at Davos will be simply enormous, equal to the public debt of a small country somewhere. And that happens every single year. Leo Varadkar, the Prime Minister of Ireland at the time of recording, is there for what may well be his last public event. But no problem, Leo. Like Mr Blair, you have got a big future on the corporate capitalist circuit. There'll be no input there, of course, from the sovereign government of Venezuela, whose pretender to the throne is currently roaming around central London with a begging bowl in his hand. Mind you, it's already brimful with Venezuela's gold that was stolen. There'll be no input from Iran, currently under 800 different sanctions imposed by the plutocrats who are in their chalets right now on the slopes of Davos. The emerging big political and economic powers like China and Russia have only bit parts. They are on the outer edge of the choir. Center stage are those who have for a long time ruled and despoiled the world. The purpose of Davos is to try and squeeze some more years, some more decades out of the hegemony of the neoliberal orthodoxy and imperialism abroad. I believe that the day is coming when these plutocrats will cease to rule the world. If not an avalanche this year on the Swiss Alps, then one day an exorcism of all the devils of Davos. Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. I can bring you more now on the rocket attack in Baghdad. We're hearing that five rockets have landed in Baghdad's green zone, where the U.S. Embassy and various Iraqi government buildings are located. It's emerging that three of the rockets definitely struck the U.S. Embassy itself, with one hitting its restaurant. Al Arabiya are, are quoting security sources on that. Baghdad's green zone, where the U.S. Embassy is currently located, has recently been the subject of several attacks. The latest one occurred just earlier today when three Katyusha rockets fell near the American embassy, according to Iraq's Al Sumaria TV. No casualties confirmed uh, so far. And uh, lots and lots of paperwork. I'm sorry, I'm not going to get to much uh, of it. Milky Fox says, OK, George, but you've spent your whole career convincing the Arabs they're owed the land, and now they believe it belongs to them 
at any cost. My goodness, Milky Fox, what influence I must have. Uh, we all know it would turn into South Africa, and we don't want another one of those. How revealing, how revealing that such a zealot for Mr. Netanyahu prays in aid the multi-racial democracy of South Africa. We don't want another one of those, do we? No Milky Fox, it would have been better to keep it under apartheid, wouldn't it? Just like your pet state. Al Pacino, not the real one, says Israel-Palestine state, yes, great idea. They can then destroy another country, like all the others that surround the tiny 200 miles speck of land that is Israel. Israel built a nation from sand and to create a nation that leads the world in science and medicine. Sure, they will give that up. Now, let's take uh, some calls. Jason is in Kidderminster. Jason, welcome. Hello, hello, George. Welcome. Yeah, I just want to take my hat off to you and say fair play for what you do. I don't agree with everything you say, but fair play to you. No one mutes you, mate. Thanks, mate. Thanks a lot. And uh, if it's OK, I just want to take my hat off to a couple of other people. That is uh, one of the doctors who died on the front line, uh, this Liang Wudong, uh, against the coronavirus, you know. Yeah. Fair play to people like him. Yeah. You know what I mean? We need them. And uh, Chelsea Manning. I mean, if that was a mobster, I think they would have turned rat by now, you know, to get out of jail. But fair play to her. She hasn't said nothing. Yeah, I just wanted to speak about the impeachment anyway. Yeah, go on. Well, basically, I, I mean, I don't like Trump. In my opinion, he's a racist, he's a misogynist. But that being said, I'm going to defend him now because it is absolutely ridiculous what they're doing against him. Number one, they completely ignore what Joe Biden has been doing with his son, you know, giving him money. It's just crony capitalism. Yeah. It is absolutely ridiculous. And the Democrats just completely ignore it. And the other day, I even heard that John Kerry's stepson was also on the board of Burisma. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Jobs and for the boys, Jason. Yeah, yeah. But basically, what, 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 what they're doing is they're just saying, that, uh, uh, what, in my opinion, that because they're saying, oh, Joe Biden, it was OK for him to get rid of that prosecutor because it was sanctioned through the state. But what Trump's doing wasn't sanctioned through the state. And to me, what they're basically saying is that it's because Joe Biden knows how to work the state machinery to get it to do what he wants. But Trump, because he's not a politician, let's face it, he doesn't know, you know, he just banged, he just wants things done. Like okay, business. thanks, Jason. Mike Davidson says Jews, Christians and Muslims exist together. Were you dropped on your head as a kid? unloved as a child and blame everyone else. You're a sad, sick creature. Thanks for watching, Mike, nonetheless. And John Harris says, we couldn't build a Lego hospital in five days, let, al let alone a real one. We have much to learn from China. Beeswax says, yes, hats off to the Chinese. They may have been a bit slow off the block, but they're sure running like hell to make up for it. Thanks for that. Ian in Hounslow is on the line. Let's hear from him. Ian, go ahead. Hello, George. Hi. Nice to talk to you again. And you. I, I just wanted to say that I was at the rally yesterday outside Belmarsh Prison. Yeah. Uh, and I have to say, when we heard that Julian had been released from solitary thanks to three um, sequential demonstrations by the prisoners, our spirits lifted because we were very worried about his health. He wasn't doing very well at all. No, no. And we had a socialist choir there uh, called the Strawberry Thieves singing socialist anthems. We had Women Against Rape. Uh, there was about 200 of us. Uh, and we gathered around the centre reservation. You know it yourself, outside yeah. the prison and mm -hmm. on the grass verge. Mm -hmm. But there was about four cops there who wouldn't let us in on the ground, so we couldn't go up to the prison and demonstrate it outside. But uh, also... Uh, the whole atmosphere uh, of the international, you know, the international, of the French people coming over, the last time we were there, because it's once a month now, we had MPs from Germany coming over, expressing their support, and it, it was really good to see all these people coming together to support this guy. 
Good. Well done, Ian. Thanks a lot. I'm pressing on because of the hour. Cliff McQueen says, uh, you are saying who else could build a 1,000 bed hospital in five days? Who else could cover up an epidemic for a whole month and delete all internet references to it? If you wish to praise China, George, get the whole story. And Flying Scotsman says, it's amazing what a country can do with no workers' rights. Uh, Darren Dickinson, on the other hand, says in the UK, we can't get a pothole in the road fixed for 12 months. And Grumbleweed says in Britain, who can get planning permission within five months, let alone build a hospital? How long has the new one at Liverpool been going on? Plus, China can build a 5,000 bed facility in five days. Surely we can do more for our homeless. Let's hear from Rashid in Long Beach. Go ahead, Rashid. George, how are you? Um, I'm good. I wish I, I was wanted, in Long Beach. I uh, wish you were with me, George. Uh, Thanks, uh, what I just wanted to say from uh, my view of the U.S., looking back at what, what happened in the U.K. over the last couple of months, is that it seems to me that Jeremy Corbyn was probably the greatest opportunity for a truly socialist government for the working people of the United Kingdom for over 50 years. Go back to Michael Foote, your friends. And somehow, for whatever reason, so-called Labor Party members uh, decided to first immediately go on a smear campaign of Jeremy Corbyn and his allies, and they used the really ugly and uh, wrong charge of anti-Semitism. You know him well, and anybody who listened to him for the last 30, 40 years knew that was not anything to do with Jeremy Corbyn. It wasn't a part of his core in any ca capacity, or the people, uh, just like Mr. Samuelson, who were surrounded by him. And at the same time, you had other members in the Labour Party who literally, you know, turned their back on their their constituencies and made Brex, you know, uh, defeating Brexit the whole focus of their uh, political being. Mm. I'd I'd like to describe these people not, you know, in the best terms as they were when you had the greatest opportunity for a truly socialist government for working people, and they went out of their way to destroy that opportunity. I think that's traitorous either to the UK or at least traitorous it's definitely to the working a, people it's, the UK. It's definitely a fifth column, Rashid. I'm amazed you could see all that so clearly from Long Beach when so many people in Britain uh, cannot uh, see it. Let's, uh, no, look, let me tell you about the poll. It's very interesting. Poll number two. Following the Davos summit, should Greta Thunberg, A, go back to school, 68%, B, stand for parliament, 10%, C, be given a Nobel Prize, 62%. 865 people have voted so far. You can vote on my Twitter feed. David is in Texas. Let's hear from him. David, go ahead. George? Yeah. Yes, sir. I've got a boxing analogy for you. Okay, go on. Excuse me, I've got that. Good. I've I got like, a boxing analogy based, like boxing. based on an go assumption. Ahead. Yeah. Wilder and Fury, you know, they've got that rematch coming up next month. Yeah. The greatest puncher versus the greatest boxer on, mm -hmm. on planet Earth, you know. And I'm looking at this uh, election coming up with the debates, uh, Trump. And I'm looking at um, the assumption is Bernie is going to be the presidential nominee and Tulsa is going to be the vice president. And when those debates come, I can guarantee you that who's going to be hitting like Deontay and what two guys can't box like Tyson Fury? And it's a good I'm analogy. Sure it, it, it's, it's a good analogy. Um, you you don't really think that Bernie will pick Tulsi Gabbard as his VP, do you? He won't. He won't. He won't win the nomination if he doesn't pick her. He won't. He he. He'll, I mean, he won't win the election. But how many me. delegates <laughs> is she going to have at the convention? I tell you what, she's going to have. And she's going to have knockout power, like Deontay. She's going to be crushing these guys. First, you know, she can, she can debate the evangelical warmonger, Pence. She'll light him up. I mean, she'll destroy him. And then what I'm hoping is maybe Bernie will go down with, like, some kind of an injury or something, you know, probably about an hour before he's going to debate Trump, and let her go in there and fill in for Bernie and light him up like a Christmas tree. She'll destroy him. I mean, put it this way. They better have somebody better have their finger on the button. Like you got a somebody right now. If I say something, a cuss word or something, they're gonna they're gonna cut me off, right? Yeah. There better be somebody with their finger on the button there because she will destroy him. 
and and this will be Bernie's revenge. Well, very well, interesting, it, very interesting, uh, David. I'm always up for boxing metaphors, uh, and uh, I'm ringing the bell on you only because of the hour. Thanks for the call. George is in Cardiff. Let's hear from him. George. Hello. Yes, George, go Hello. ahead. Go ahead. Hi there. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to call up and say, basically, I left the Labour Party purely because it's, you can see how centrist it's become. Um, it's dropped all of its socialist values. And, you know, Interesting. Decided, even, even Chris Williamson seemed to accept that. Yeah, exactly. And it's a shame that he won't be able to join me in uh, coming along with the Workers' Party of Britain, which is my new party of choice. Oh, excellent. Um, are you coming to our meeting in Birmingham on Saturday? I am indeed. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've made sure that I've cleared all my schedules. I've got to make sure I'm there. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that, George. Thanks. Uh, I was just about to say that the Eventbrite uh, you just type in George Galloway Eventbrite, you'll see the meeting come up. It's only three quid, and that's just to cover the hall. Uh, uh, or even in Extremis, you can come along. It's at the Cars Lane Church Centre in Cars Lane, uh, C-A-R-R-S, Lane, L-A-N-E, in Birmingham on Saturday, starting at 11 o'clock. Be sure and be there early, George, all the way from Cardiff, or you'll miss my yeah. first speech. No, I'll definitely be there, and I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Excellent, mate. Thanks very much indeed for that call. Socialist Sister says, the West will never be objective where China is concerned. Anwar Bodja says, China doesn't deserve any admiration for handling coronavirus. They've quarantined two million Muslims, and Allah has forced them to quarantine 17 million of their own people. And Bilzer says, can all that concrete dry in five days? I'm no expert, but concrete takes an average of 28 days to cure. Sounds like it's castles made of sand, George. Maybe it's not made of concrete, Bilza. Uh, and uh, John, I've read this one uh, already, I think. No, it's different. Uh, no, it isn't. It's the same. Marcelo Bezerra Cavalcanti. Marcello Bezzera Cavalcanti, what a wonderful name, from Florence in Italy, what a wonderful place. To understand how the centre-right may win the Italian election today and how this result can change our politics, possible exit from the European Union is the right Italian political objectives. Happy New Year in China, happy Carnival in Brazil. Thank you, uh, Marcello. Rochelle is on the line in New Jersey. Let's hear from her. Rochelle, welcome. Uh, hi, how are you? I'm good. Um, um, thank you for having me. And um, I just wanted to make uh, an observation about uh, why Israel has so much control and sway in the American government. It's just something that I've seen recently. I guess it's been obvious for years. But I see that the United States... Um, for a long time has had long-term goals of creating empire, going to countries that have, um, you know, uh, natural resources, some in the Middle East and some in South America, and they need Israel to help them install their regime change governments sure. as they recently sure. did in, in Bolivia. In that sense then, Rochelle, it's Israel that's serving America, not the other way around. It's really important this. Yeah, uh, in tail, a way, The tail in a way, doesn't yeah, wag the dog. But, the dog is American imperialism, and Israel's merely the tail. Well, I think that's what it is. I mean, Israel really takes advantage of its position and pushes much too hard. Sure, sure. Some people you know, don't want to... Wanna... doesn't have to push very hard, Russia, because Israel's doing America's bidding in the region. Well, that's why they get. Oh, I mean, that's why they get away with what they get away with. Yeah, which yeah. Is, you know, it's uh, outrageous. But the Andy, problem is, eight hundred million dollars a year from you, from your taxes. It's much more than that when you talk well, about. Uh, well, you know, if you it, include private uh, uh, funds, yes, but tax dollars, eight hundred million every year plus weaponry that even the U.S. Uh, military forces don't have themselves. Yes. Well, but the, what the point I'm getting to is now I finally understand why they have only spoke about a two-state solution. It's because the United States does not ever want to give up Israel as a country. It is too important 
to, uh, as their terrorist group, to install governments. If they had a one-state, you know, solution and with Palestine, they would lose that uh, Israeli uh, imperative, you know. And so it's very overwhelming and it's very saddening to think about that. And, you know, when you think about it in those terms, it's kind of like, they have, they're so entrenched in world power that it's like trying to push over a mountain. Well, uh, faith and, can move mountains, Rochelle, and there's no point in being uh, overwhelmed. You need to use the knowledge that you have now worked out for yourself and join up with others uh, who uh, understand it similarly. Thanks for the call. Mark is in North Carolina. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, what's up there, uh, George? George, you know... Uh, I think uh, it's about time we could take all our troops out of the Middle East completely. As a matter of fact, I take my I, I take American troops out of everywhere around the world. And well, definitely out of the Middle East very quickly, country. Mark. If they don't uh, leave by yeah. agreement, they're going to leave under shot and shell. That's what I'm worried about. Being a veteran myself, I don't want to see American troops die for nothing. Exactly. All right, they're not. They shouldn't have to die for the corporations. They shouldn't have to die for Israel. They shouldn't have to die for Saudi Arabia, okay? That's not right, and they shouldn't have to kill anybody for these for, for this either, okay? Um, Trump is a uh, Trump disgusts me. He, you know, he said we're stealing their oil. He confessed to it already, okay? We I'm love not, we love oil, he, yeah. I mean, uh, he's only taking uh, Rumsfeld's uh, prescription further, isn't he? When Donald said uh, it's not our fault that God put America's oil under other people's countries. You know, George, I would be for impeachment if they impeach him for stuff like that. Yeah. But this Ukraine nonsense is just that nonsense. If anything, exactly. he's right on that because yeah. I know how, how corrupt. It's Joe Biden that should be being president. impeached. Yeah, I mean, you know, but as far as as far as the murder of Soleimani and all that, that's that's an impeachable offense. That's cold blooded murder. What he did exactly. You know? Um, Mark, just as a matter of interest, you, you're a veteran yourself. What unit were you in? What outfit were you in? Well, I was in the Army. I didn't really do much. I wasn't in combat or nothing like that. I, you know, was a, during the Cold War. Well, but, you, um, you, 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 know. did a, you did a bit much more than President Reagan. Thanks a lot, Mark, uh, from North Carolina. George, the coronavirus won't bother me. I'll just swap to San Miguel. Regards, Alex. Sorry, is that... I'm hearing that there's a beer issue there. It's gone over my head. Uh, Jennifer says, I want to send you my letter of resignation from the Labour Party sent to Jeremy, uh, sorry, to Jenny Formby. Uh, Jennifer, by all means, send it to me on Twitter or on Facebook. Uh, Daniel says, you claim to be in solidarity with Jews who suffered from the horror of the Holocaust, whilst also being a lifelong supporter of Palestine. Why don't you address the fact that the founding father of Palestinian nationalism, the Mufti Haj Amin al Husseini, was a known Nazi collaborator and vehement anti Semite who deliberately stopped Jews from going to Palestine and knew that those Jews would probably be exterminated? That father of Palestinian nationalism allied himself with the worst, most anti Semitic genocidal regime in history. How do you reconcile that? asks Daniel. I'm not sure I have any need to reconcile uh, anything, uh, Daniel. Uh, it's a, a, a debating point, a poor one. First of all, Haj Amin al-Husseini was not the founding father of Palestinian nationalism. His flirtation with the Nazis was repugnant, despicable, uh, utterly beyond the pale, and has nothing to do at all with the subsequent erasure of the existing state of Palestine from the map. Its name literally wiped off the map. Its people scattered to the four winds. The Palestinian people did nothing in the Holocaust. The Holocaust was a European Christian affair. Yet the Palestinian Arabs, Muslim and Christian, have been forced to pay the price of it. That's a much more important point isn't it than the point that you have made? But thanks for watching, Daniel, anyway. And uh, uh, Chris in Derry says, what are your thoughts on the Belmarsh inmates 
campaigning to take Assange out of solitary confinement. They succeeded a few days ago. Well, I never thought I'd say this, Chris, but hats off to the inmates of Belmarsh Prison. Jed is in the Isle of Man. Let's go to him. Hello there, George. Hello Jed, there, how are you doing? You're the first caller from the Isle of Man. I'm very, very <laughs> glad to hear from you. Go on. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, it's just how quiet things are today from uh, UK government. Uh, we've got uh, over 15 million people uh, held in China, and there's no real public comment on uh, news channels from uh, from those in power uh, in the UK. So it's just your thoughts on that, really, George. Well, uh, the British uh, stated yesterday that everyone who had been tested from Wuhan that had entered Britain uh, proved negative. That's a very good thing. And I hope that a great deal of care is taken about anyone coming uh, from Wuhan uh, and other affected areas in China, indeed in the world, is, uh, is taken. Um, the Chinese government, I think, is fully engaged and has gotten to grips with the matter. And we must hope that it doesn't uh, um, go very much further. The potential uh, of millions of uh, infected people and huge numbers of deaths is such that everyone should be getting behind China's efforts to contain this epidemic. Uh, that's my view. What about you? Well, there's nobody speaking about it, really. Uh, I, I've, been speaking, about, I've been speaking about it all night. I'm not hearing about anyone in the uh, cabinet, though. Really? Um, yeah. This is this is the one thing that could stop Liverpool winning the uh, Premiership uh, title. Very sad that it is. So uh, fingers <laughs> crossed, um, okay. we'll get it sorted. Thank you very much. There's a legend okay. on the line. It's Norma in Bristol. Norma, welcome. Hello, George. First of all, um, how's your husband? Oh well, he's out of hospital. Oh, how wonderful! And, um, Hallelujah. Yeah, he's improving slowly now. Yes, thank you. Excellent. Well, give him uh, the regards from the whole of the uh, Open University, please. <laughs> he likes to hear that, yes. Excellent. Very good. Um, just a couple of points, really. Um, you know this coronavirus? Well, if I had the, the poll in front of me that you had, I would put D in. That is, to find out an antidote for it as soon as possible, you know. And then the millions of people that can be vaccinated against it would stop the thing accelerating. And that's the main thing, isn't it? Because they haven't got an antidote to it. They haven't got a vaccination. Uh, I, you know more than me. I don't know what they have got. Uh, but the, 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 you cannot uh, budget for uh, or legislate for the mutation of all these viruses. No, because, no. Uh, and some of them could even be man-made. Some of them could be being deliberately engineered and introduced yeah. as they are in this fiction uh, yeah. called uh, called Condor that I referred to earlier that I'm yeah. recommending everyone should uh, watch. Yeah. We, we've got to hope that this is a naturally occurring uh, virus and not one that has been weaponized. And we've got to hope that the Chinese get on top of it. Of all the health services in the world that I trust to do that, I'd, I'd put the Chinese up there high, wouldn't you? Well, my husband was saved in Hong Kong from dying. Well, Twenty go. something years ago, and the last quick one, George. Yeah. Didn't Shrewsbury do well against the um, Liverpool to come to come back at the sort of end of the, the match today? I don't know what was the score. Oh, two two, and they've got to have a replay in Liverpool. How wonderful for Shrewsbury! That is really good news. That'll please <laughs> the club treasurer. That's for well, sure. Yeah. I thought you yeah. were going to refer to my team winning six. Nothing against no, the that mighty was, that was the other, Rovers. That was the other, you know, that was the other lot, wasn't it? Six beautiful six goals, deal. five yeah. of them in the first half. Oh, well, oh, yeah. that is interesting. Well done, Shrewsbury. A great <laughs> cup team, actually. Norma, thanks for bringing that to our attention. Following the Davos summit, should Greta Thunberg, A, go back to school, 70% of you, whopping. B, stand for parliament, 10%. C, be given the Nobel Prize, 20%, down Two. Seems like there's a consensus in this university that it's time for Greta Thunberg uh, to go back to school. I had to leave time for Paul Benny in Glasgow. Excellent show, as always. For your Hall of Fame, I would like to nominate the late great Baroness Margaret Thatcher. She was an incredible politician, doing the supposed impossible by becoming the first woman leader 
of the Conservative Party and becoming the first woman Prime Minister of the UK. Her legacy still shapes UK politics and society. Surely a deserved inductee to your Hall of Fame. That's from Paul Benny, the only Thatcherite in Glasgow. Let me take my glasses off and dry my eyes uh, from the tears that uh, your uh, email uh, have brought forth. Tears, tears of uh, mirth rather than sadness. I was with uh, the great Elvis Costello uh, on the day that she passed and tramping the dirt down. Whether she should be in our Hall of Fame, let's let the viewers and listeners decide. I'll take it, Paul, that this is an official nomination by you of Margaret Thatcher, and we'll debate it in a subsequent uh, edition of the mother of all talk shows. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you, and if it was, come back next week at the same time in the same place and bring other viewers and listeners with you. I don't know if this will be another, our second, one million viewer audience. I hope so. But even if it isn't, I'm determined to get back up there again. Good night.